Thomas Payne. Thomas Payne. Thomas Payne. Sam Adams. Sam Adams. Sam Adams. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. These men spoke up for what they thought was right. From their courage came such documents as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. From their willingness to speak what was sometimes unpopular but right, we enjoy such liberties as freedom of speech, the right to keep and bear arms, and freedom of religion. There are those who still wish to oppress our freedoms, and there are still patriots willing to stand up and defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Men like Zeb Bell, who honor our founding fathers and what they stood for. It's now time for Zeb at the ranch, speaking up and defending your freedoms. Brought to you by Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers and all of the other great advertisers on the program. And now, Zeb Bell. The way it is. Here are some more of the men's rules for 2014. Ladies, listen up now. If something we said can be interpreted two ways, and one of the ways makes you sad or angry, we meant the other one. And also, I am in shape. Round is a shape. Good morning, everybody. Here comes Kate Smith, and God bless America, followed by a patriot with our Pledge of Allegiance. Foggy outside. And a lot of people might say it's even foggy inside. We'll see. A lovely lady right there. The beautiful Kate Smith, and God bless America. Good morning, everybody, on this Tuesday, January 21st. I'm Zeb Bell at Zeb at the Ranch with our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you. And, of course, uh, some of our great advertisers like Lee's Furniture Floors and more. I love my pillow. Oh, thank goodness I've got one of those memory foam pillows. Right after surgery, I came home and started using it oh yeah lease furniture floors and more western way services always at your disposal get on the route service today call kelly and the crew seven three four six nine six nine and now without further ado we go across the river and through the wood to gina's house we go well, good morning, sunshine. <laughs> I only wish that were true. <laughs> <laughs> I keep on saying it because maybe it will actually happen. Oh, uh, yeah, we'll get sunshine sometime today. It'll break through. And uh, how are you doing? I am doing just fantabulous and ready for another busy show. Well, you know, yesterday I um, tried some new exercises on my leg. And how did that go? Um, yesterday, I tried some new exercises on my leg. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, somebody's a little bit stiff and sore today. A little? Are you kidding? Okay. You know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. And there are certain things, even prior to the surgery, that my body is going to look at and say, don't give me that. <laughs> It'll be saying, are you crazy, bud? You want me to do what? I went to get out of bed this morning and start the paraphernalia put on, you know, because of the surgery. you got to put on special stuff, you know, to protect it and everything. Yes, uh-huh. And I have never been so stiff and sore in my life. Well, it means that the physical therapy is working. Oh, good. Yes. I'm glad. Yes. There's good news to come out of all of this. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, age, the golden age, and then trying to recoup and everything, it's not fun. Well, um, I'm glad I'm just 41. Oh, you whipper snapper. <laughs> Man, do you make me jealous. Make uh, me jealous. Know, I know. No, actually, I've been blessed. And uh, I, I did some things yesterday on my leg that I hadn't been able to do for over a year. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's good news. Why, I was going to jump up in the air and wave my arms, and then I remembered I'm on crutches and thought that might be a bad thing to do. <laughs> They still got you on the walker, too? <laughs> nah, man, I was on my crutches yesterday, and uh, and I actually managed to walk a relatively good distance without taking a nosedive or calling the tower for a landing. So basically, you made it from your desk to the geezer chair, which is, hey, hey that's good news. Let me tell you something. That geezer chair is an incentive. And it is. It's like an oasis in the desert when you're looming around the corner. But you've been <laughs> in my house. I have. You get to the kitchen and you peek around the corner and you see that geezer chair and you go, 
Life is good. Yes, and nobody else gets to sit in the geezer chair except for the geezer. You touch my geezer chair. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you. Ain't going to happen. Uh, do we have a pledger? We do have someone special on for the pledge, and then we have Michael Rogers on for the weather. Very good. Good morning with our Pledge of Allegiance. Go, please. Hey, Zeb. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, I'm going to be really, I'm sorry, but you did a fantastic job. Who is this? Zeb, this is Andy Schwab, and I just called you because I'm still jacked about the uh, Seahawks coming to the Super Bowl, so I had to call you today and... Uh, just keep you reminded about it. Let me, yeah, let me tell you something. I am on your side. I am on your side. I want you to win the Super Bowl. I think I, w I was going to call you on the air a little bit later on this morning, but now that you're here, knowing you and your professionalism, because you are a pro, uh, honestly, the only diminishment to that victory was Richard Sherman and his big mouth. Yeah, he does. He's, he's a little arrogant, but we, uh, I think every team probably has a few of those. So. Uh, well, the Green Bay Packers have had more than just a few, let me tell you that. But uh, congratulations, kudos to you, and uh, is there any special event happening in Burley if they win the Super Bowl? I mean, like, are you going to have a ticker tape parade? Are you going to roll spare tires down the road? That's right. What's that going to be? We should put one together, that's for sure. You know what you could do? You could get all the old tires, and you could tie them together, and we'll just, you know, drag old tires down the street and have people throw confetti and everything. I think that'd be fantastic. <laughs> that's a good idea, Zab. That's, a, that's right. Hey, man, God bless you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Randy. You too. See you, Zab. You betcha. There is one of the nicest people in the world, Randy, over at Tires West. And I'm telling you, he is higher than high over the Seattle Seahawks going to the Super Bowl as is Gina Jameson, let me hey, tell you. Yeah. Go Hawks, baby. <laughs> there you go. Is Michael there? He is. All right, Michael, good morning with the weather forecast. Morning, everybody. 25 in Murta. Look for more of the same like yesterday. Sun and clouds, high 43. High tomorrow, 48. Overnight low, 32. Have a great day. Enjoy the weather. Stay on the weather you got. Michael, wait a minute. Wait a minute. i got to ask you something. And you and your omnipotent knowledge. Uh, fog. Why are we getting so much fog? Deb, you're kidding me, right? You're, you're, you really want to know that, really? I, I asked. Oh, okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, fog is nothing but a cloud that's on the ground. Uh, it's on the ground, all right. And, uh, the Magic Valley being famous for inversion yeah. this time of year, that's what you're in right now. Mm. So what you have is a lot of moisture on the ground. You have a lot of cold air on the ground, and you have high pressure that's not letting that moisture rise out and mix out into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And in those valley locations like you are, right on the other side of the South Hills, that moisture, you got fog, and you got a lot of it. Boy, I and guess. Until that inversion breaks, that high pressure breaks down, you're going to see this for quite a while. It's normal, normal weather pattern for the Magic Valley. Idaho and Utah are famous for fog. And inversion. So I didn't know that they were famous. There you go. I didn't know they were famous for fog. You know, I think when I think about fog, I think of places like uh, maybe New Orleans or maybe places like, well, overseas, like in London and places like that. Yeah, you got, um, you don't have a great water source, but you got one. It's called Snake River. Yeah. And uh, water retains heat longer than land. So the bottom line, and not to make you bored of meteorology, um, the sun hitting the Snake River is going to retain that heat, and that moisture is just going to just stay there. And uh -huh. right now, it's cold enough to produce a cloud right on the ground. Okay. Until this inversion breaks, or until this high pressure breaks down, that it'll let that moisture rise into the atmosphere. You're going to get this all the time. Salt Lake City and Idaho are famous for inversions that produce ground fog in the month of January and February. Oh, be nope. darn. See, I asked the question and the encyclopedia of weather knowledge was right there with the answer. God bless you, MichaelRogersWeather.com. Have a great day.
You too, by now. Thank you. A man knows, hey, listen, SafeLink Internet. They know, too, because they are Idaho's number one high-speed wireless Internet. Mm -mm -mm, absolutely the best. Deanne's working on the computer right now. Thank goodness we have them right here at Zeb at the Ranch. Hey, listen, give them a call. Get on the program. Call the rest of the folks and say, please install it for me today. SafeLink Internet. Number to call, 677-8000. 677-8000. No contracts required. No credit checks, unlimited data, high speeds up to 15 megabytes. <laughs> you didn't think I knew what that meant? I do. And that's all at SafeLink Internet. 677-8000. You call them now. Also, Daryl's Cleaners. My goodness sakes, uh, everybody's kind of looking forward to spring. Well, don't put away your winter coats yet. Uh-uh-uh, we still got some cold weather here. But, uh, you know, as you look forward to packing things away, like maybe the tablecloth from the Christmas dinner and everything else, oh, don't put it away with the stains. Get everything clean and ship shape right now. Take it all in to Daryl's Cleaners at 1223 Albion Avenue in Burley. Absolutely the best. No kidding. Uh-uh, that's not bragging. It's true. Daryl's Cleaners, 1223 Albion Avenue in Burley, serving you. Okay, now it's time for some calls, 436-2244, let us see, boy, I'm telling you one thing that is concerning, and I have a question for any and all of you out there. Would you, if you had the opportunity, if you had the financial standing, if you had the tickets, would you go to Sochi for the Winter Olympics? This is turning into every day, every minute, every hour, a watch list for various terrorists that uh, some people think they've been sighted over there. Some people have sighted some of them over there. There is a continuance of threats going on 24-7, and uh, they've got major problems. As a matter of fact, as of this morning, I was watching the news. And they've got five women, five young ladies, I think they're all around in their either late 20s or early 30s, that are considered to be black widows of terrorism. And they are making plans that has leaked out to somewhere during the Olympics uh, detonate suicide bombs. And, and this is just atrocious. This is a mess. What is this world coming to or has already arrived at? That killing, killing, maiming, and destroying is the main incentive for these absolute, brainless, destitute people. What kind of a world are we living in? You know, it's nothing new to have the Olympics be an event that has been targeted by terrorists. But right now, Putin and the rest of the folks over in Russia... You would assume that right now would be a great time for Putin to open up the doors of uh, knowledge and other ways of combating terrorism and say to any and all, whether it's the United States, whether it's Great Britain, it doesn't make any difference who it is, I need help. If we're going to put this uh, Winter Olympics on, we need your assistance. I don't know if it's going to happen. I think that there's going to be a lot of athletes that are going to draw out. Uh, I think it's absolutely, uh, just absolutely terrible that an event that's so well liked and received and everybody looks forward to it, either the Summer or the Winter Olympics, could be in definite jeopardy of even happening thanks to killers, killers, worthless killers bent on doing nothing more than destroying humanity. Your thoughts. Give me a call. 436-224-1866-927-4587. Well, I'm waiting for your call. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. That I know is coming in. Do not forget that for all your livestock, the smart lit tubs and the catalytic blocks all over there at Valley White Home and Ranch. Oh my, you got questions? They've got answers. They've uh, got all the great selections of uh, your cattle and livestock feed. They've got all the dog and kitty cat food. They've got it all for you. 
And don't forget, they've got ice melt, and they've got all the heaters, and they've got, uh, by the way, that little kind of a cafeteria they've got in there, absolutely really neat. You know, like uh, hot lunch with soup, and, and you can go in there early in the morning and visit with your friends, have a cup of coffee. It is the place to go. Valleywide Home and Ranch, 910 South Oneida and Rupert. You stop in and see those good folks today. All right, now it's your turn. 436 2244 Um I do not understand. I do understand that. That's the cow. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Well, good morning, Mr. Bell. It sounds like you're feeling a whole bunch better. Don't push it. <laughs> no. Well, I was keeping, I was keeping my fingers crossed. Well, you know what? I, I've, I've got to say that uh, the good Lord has blessed me, and of course, the ends helping me all the time. And every day, yes, there's been some improvement. And every day, my patient says there should be much more improvement. That's the problem. Uh huh. But remember the other day when I was over. Remember what I told you? About age. Mm, yeah, I know. I keep hearing that three-letter word, and it just scares me. <laughs> age. Old. Yeah. No, I say old. I just think you're not 19 anymore, bucko. Well, you know something, though? Um, like the doctor said, it's interesting, and it's also, it helps in the healing process to have goals as if you were 19 years of age. Well, I don't know about that. I do know about that. I do know about that, and I'm an expert on that. And I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like I'm bragging, but I am uh, bragging on something that I'm very much aware of. The doctors that I've talked to over the years have told me that many times people over 50 when they have major surgery or something like that they really don't have a lot of goals and they just sit there and they try to heal up and they don't really have anything to get up and want to get out of that wheelchair for I do and they said that they really look forward to having people like me because they knew that I would exceed their expectations as far as healing time where'd you go she left me while I'm waiting for that call to come back and take another one, good heavens, it must be the fog this morning. Let's not uh, forget our friends at Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. Oh, my goodness, they're open 730 in the morning to 530, Monday through Friday. They've got all your furnace air filters so that when you turn your furnace up, it's going to go, yeah, buddy, here comes some more heat. Are you ready for it? And then they've got all the heat lamps and the extension cords. They've got all your electrical needs. These are the professionals serving you where they provide warm winters and cool summers. Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. Good morning. I don't know who I've got on the phone this time. Hey there, Jim. Yes, sir. Yeah, hey, it's great to have you back on the air, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, you're healing up. That's good. You know what? Don't be impatient. Just take one day at a time. And you'll get there. Oh, I am, but, you know, I'm one of these guys where if they say, well, here, we want you to do 20 of these, well, then I want to do 30. And if they say, well, we want you to do 30 of these, then I want to do 40, because I figure it's going to put uh, me back faster. Just like me. All right. Hey, good to hear from you. Uh, yeah, just, just hang in there. We're with you, buddy. All right. Appreciate it, and thank you, Rodney. And don't forget, our next Lunch Bunch is going to be coming up next week on the 30th, okay? Oh, I'll be there. All right. Thanks, Rodney. Appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. God bless. Caller number two, you're on the air. No, well, hey, excuse me again, Zeb. Sorry about that. You're lost. Cell phones, are, cell phones are just wonderful. You know, I've been having a lot of trouble with my cell phone the last couple of days. Yesterday, five times I was in the middle of phone calls, and all of a sudden I just had a very uh, non-informative call with myself. Yeah, you just sit there and go, uh, uh, hello, hello. Yeah. But no, seriously, you know, Donna, what we were talking about a minute ago, uh, I think no, people I that don't have goals and don't have, have aspirations and look forward to something, those are people that really have a hard time trying to heal up after anything. Yeah, they do. And, and you're right. I agree with you. Um, we, we do need to have goals, even if we don't have surgery. We need to have goals. Um, but after surgery, especially after 50, 45, 50 years old, it does take a little bit longer to heal, you know, because your body is, is uh, a little bit slower to recuperate. Yeah. But that, does, that doesn't mean that you can't push yourself a little bit farther each day. 
you, uh, you know, to, to achieve that goal. And, and I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't saying that, you know, you didn't have a goal. Um, you know, I just, I, I, your body doesn't heal like it, it used to. No, but I'll tell you something. There's one of these exercises, and I, I'll just tell you what it's like. I'm sitting in my wheelchair, and I put my foot on a book, okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then and then we try to push it back towards the wheelchair as much as we can to get, you know, the bend in the knee. Right. And this morning, my lovely bride of 42 years, uh, I was not prepared for the surge, let's say, that took place from the start to the finish. And I absolutely came up out of that wheelchair like I had been healed. And I yelled and screamed. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness sakes, nothing could be worse. <laughs> yeah, right. It's kind of touchy. I love it. <laughs> but no, it, it's coming along. It's coming along. That, that's wonderful, and I'm 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 really I'm really proud of you, and I'm, I'm glad that it, it you're doing so well. But you know what what I what I called for was, you know, we have a an administration right now who has no comprehension of what is needed to take care of this country. We have so much crap going on in this country and in our foreign countries that we're not addressing. Um, if I was part of the Olympic family in the United States, and maybe I'm wrong for thinking this way, but, you know, with all the, the terrorist attacks going on over there and, you know, in, in different countries, especially Russia, um, and they now find they have three women that are inside the, the circle, um, I would say, no, my child is not going. Sorry. Mm -mm, ain't going to happen. Well, I think that you're going to see uh, some huge decisions made in the next couple of days, either from mm -hmm. a spectator point of view and also from a team standpoint as far as some of the athletes and everything. Um, a lot of it depends on whether or not the uh, internal police of the uh, Sochi uh, Olympics find these, um, these women that are called the Black Widows, and there's also another terrorist group, too, where the, a couple of guys were so brazen that they actually sent a video of themselves sitting at a table showing their plotting and planning as to how they're going to try to blow up a certain area of the Olympics. Donna, there is no court system, no court system necessary for these people. They need to be taken out. They, they do. I, I agree a hundred percent. And you know, it's not just sushi that they're, or whatever, however you pronounce it. It's the outlying areas also. It's not just the circle of where the Olympics are going to be. It's the outlying circles that they're finding that these people are infil that they've infiltrated. Yes. How in the world are they going to find them if they don't have the right kind of security? Well, and I'm very concerned that if Putin tries to do this all by himself without basically involving an Internet system, and I mean uh -huh. Internet system, from various right. other countries, um, look out. There could be a lot more problems than they ever thought they could have. Hey, listen, thank you for all your kind thoughts. You bet, and you have a great day. I will. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Don't forget Travel Loop Supply, 1050 West, 203 South of Hayburn with my old buddy Jim McCall. Heavy emphasis on the word oh, oh, buddy, with his bubble ropes and all the oils and the tools. And don't forget to get your preseason orders in on filters for all your vehicles. My old buddy Jim McCall. He'll take care of you. 1050 West, 203 South of Hayburn. Number to call, my old buddy. Jim McCall, 438-8730. They deliver the goods, Travel Loop Supply. You get a hold of them today. Hey, it is time for the Capital Press Ag Minute. We'll be right back. Today's Ag Minute brought to you by the Capital Press, the West Ag Weekly. Tight cattle supplies continue to push beef prices higher, and analysts believe the trend could continue through the year. U.S. cattle and beef markets set records last week, blowing through the sharply higher prices set the week ending January 10th. Feeder cattle, slaughter cattle, and beef cutout values all posted record highs. Live-fed steers for slaughter for the week ending January 17th averaged $142 per hundredweight, the USDA reported. High prices are impressive, but no surprise, market analysts said. Tight beef supplies were sensitive to any market disruption, 
and that came with the large winter storms during the holidays that negatively affected cattle production, slaughter, and retail distribution. For more agriculture news and information, turn to the West Ag Weekly, the Capital Press, and CapitalPress.com. There you go. Thank you very much, Capital Press. Great newspaper. Check it out. Get one, a copy of it today. You will be hooked. Excellent. Um, it was kind of interesting yesterday on Martin Luther King Day, and I did some follow-up and wanted to listen to some of the people as to what their remarks were about the 2014 commemoration of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Well, his niece, Alveda King, very, very nice lady, very articulate, extremely well-informed, and, it, you know, one of those people you get on an interview and she just absolutely exists exudes professionalism and kindness and uh, she's just a nice lady um, didn't have a lot of good things to say about Barack Hussein Obama that's the one thing I noticed she wasn't exactly doing cartwheels for Obama as president wasn't doing a lot of things as far as saying or animating a lot of things good as far as how he has uh, done anything to uh, act like or promote the ideas and concepts of Martin Luther King Jr. So that was kind of interesting yesterday when asked a couple of questions she just very very graciously avoided a direct answer of basically in blunt terminology saying He's just not that good a guy. And I respected the way she handled it. Excellent job, Alveda King. Okay, let's see what else. We've oh, my goodness. A great, big, huge slap. A slap right across the left cheek of global warming going on again in the Midwest and the East Coast this week. I talked to my Aunt Miriam. She is locked in her home. She is blocked in her home with all the snow. All the ice, all the uh, winds and the drifting, and temperatures not to get above zero, and much lower for the rest of the week with maybe another foot of snow. And her and I both concurred this global warming is getting tough. Brother. Give me a call, 436-224-1866-927-4587. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Yeah, Zeb, uh, talk about global warming, warming. Sunday morning, my heat was off. And thanks to uh, one of your sponsors, Ramsey Electric, I made a phone call to uh, Glenn Rasmussen. Uh -huh. And Rita answered. And... Uh, it wasn't long before Glenn was out here. Really? And uh, I had a breaker go bad. Uh-huh. And he didn't have one with him. He ran back to the shop and got one. And this house, house was colder than the devil. I was going to say something else because <laughs> it didn't. But anyway, he got it going for me. Now, I'll tell you, that service. You aren't kidding. On a Sunday morning, is that right? That's right. He missed some of his church meetings. Well, there you stood with your nightcap on and your bare feet doing a twinkle toes Fred Astaire dance from one foot to the other on the linoleum floor. They knew. It they could tell. It wasn't that way, partner. It wasn't that way? I had everything, every coat I had in the house <laughs> on. I was dressed not for... Uh, global warming <laughs> you know there is nothing worse and I know you're going to agree with me in the summertime we don't think about anything like that because naturally it's the summertime but there is nothing worse than to wake up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you say to yourself we are without heat and you know that that house is an icicle you know that maybe you've got some frozen pipes you know that you've got a major problem winter time can be be really a scary time. That's right. It worries me. What if we would get sabotaged in yep. our whole power grid? Yep. And, and you know what? 
It's extremely, it's extremely possible, Fred. There have been many people talk about this, and there's been a lot of experts say that, my goodness, we've got to become more aware. We've got to become more cognizant that this problem can happen. But, you know, I, I just say this. Do you get the same impression I get as far as leadership in this country? They are totally naive, inept, and act like a bunch of doggone kindergartners. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll say I get the feeling. In fact, I'm sure of it. Well, the next time that you... We definitely are. Well, I know that Ramsey Heating and Electric appreciated your very kind remarks this morning for the great service. And uh, from now on, we'll just call you Twinkle Toes. Yeah, no, no, that isn't what I want. But, uh, I'll tell you, they are the best. All right. Fred, God bless you, man. Say hello to Joyce. Thanks much. Oh, I will. You say hello to Deanne. I will. Thank you. I Take will. care. Anyway, Thank how you. are you feeling? I'm getting better. I really am. I'm getting a little better. I'm doing a whole bunch of exercises, more so now every day. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, Fred, I'm just... I'm anxious to get back to where I was. I'm getting better according to their charts. I'm way ahead of schedule. I'm excited. I really am. Well, good. That's great to hear. All right. Okay, buddy. Thank take you, sir. Now. All right. Take care. Yeah, there's there's some dear friends. And Fred and Joyce stopped over last week to say hello to me, and that was so nice. I just, I've just i had so many nice people stop by or send me a note or an email. And it's like yesterday, <clears throat> there was no mail delivery. And Deanna and I looked at each other last night, and we said, we got a big job probably this morning at 11.30 opening up all the mail because it's going to be in bushel baskets, we're sure. And thank you for all your kind thoughts. We really appreciate it. Caller, I'll be right there. Don't forget Denny's Restaurant. Now, here's the deal, folks. The brand new location for Zeb at the Ranch and our Zeb's Lunch Bunch is at Denny's Restaurant, 611 North Overland in Burley. And we're going to be over there next Thursday. I'm going to be in a wheelchair climbing through the front door. And we're going to have lunch bunch absolutely and they've got great menus they've got a great service staff over there and i can actually attest to that because those gals went out of their way to be decent to us and really provide the best in service breakfast lunch and dinner it's always there for you at denny's restaurant in burley thank you so much the new home of zeb's lunch bunch next thursday at 11 30 don't miss it we'll see you at denny's good morning caller you're on the air at the end of uh, October, the 1st of November, my son and I were, and my employee were up in Clayton putting in some garage doors, and uh, it was commercial stuff, and my son got his finger caught in a gear, and it was, we were trying to hurry and get going to go home. And he uh, literally got the end of his finger torn off Ooh. in this gear, and uh, he came down off of the scissor lift, and uh, he told me he was very distraught because he plays the guitar and he's very accomplished. But we had to go up on the scissor lift, go get the piece of finger out of the gear and the chain, to take it down, and then we were all hurrying, trying to get to Chalice, found out there was nothing there that anybody could help us with, so we ended up driving to Salmon. Well, on the way, we Googled what we should do. We had saline for our eyes, so we rinsed it off, wrapped it up. And we went to the doctor's office in, uh, I mean, to the hospital in Salmon, and, and the doctor said, well, I can't sew that on. And it, it, the, the, the thinking behind the doctor was, if this thing doesn't take, then I'm liable. And this is the reason why health care is such a problem, because of lawsuits and other things, but whatever. Yeah. And he talked to a hand surgeon on the phone. We said, yes, we want to sew it on. We sewed it on. Uh, the finger is completely regrown now. And uh, he is playing the guitar, even though it's tender. But one of the things we did is Nora and I research all the time what we can do to make ourselves healthier with nutrition and herbs and whatever there is. And God provided us lots of things here, the technology that helps us, herbs, vitamins, minerals. And uh, the, the regrowth of that was so miraculous that it you, you, you just was amazing. Yeah. And because we thought, because his future is music, it isn't doing what I do. Mm -hmm. But um, so 
it's something if you if you have any interest or Nora and I can help you. Uh, it's truly the most important thing. I know you have to do what your doctor says, but making your body, giving your body the tools to heal itself is truly uh, vitally important. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. But you know something? Um, Just the exercise that they give you, and I've got a great, great physical therapist that's working with us. Her name is Davy Musman. She's outstanding. And she really is, uh, she's a marine drill sergeant. I mean, uh, when she says jump, I just don't ask her anything but how high. And I just love that attitude because she's going to, along with all these exercises and everything, I'm getting better to the point where I honestly believe I will be better than what I was two years ago. Well, let's just put it this way, Jeb. You know, a guy like you that has been so through so much on crutches and never, you know, your thoughts are always about what you can do, how you can do it better, and and, and, and you never think to go someplace where you would receive help other than from your friends and your church, but never any kind of welfare government help. You're independent, and you could always, you know, a guy like you could get that kind of welfare and an assistance, and you don't do it, and it's you to be commended. Well, because thank you. It ain't easy being disabled like that. Well, I'll tell you something, and I've got one other ace in the hole, and that's my wife. Uh, I get a little uh, bubbly-eyed talking about DM because... Uh, you talk about staff sergeants. I mean, she's cracking the whip. She should have been a back. She should have been born 150 years ago, and got a job running horses for Wells Fargo because those stage teams would have never quit loping. Man, she'd have cracked the whip, and they'd have made great time between every city. You see, one more thing, and then I'm gonna hang up. The thing about America and Americans is the fact that freedom, capitalism, is in our DNA. Every day I go out and I work with people that say, I don't care what anybody's doing. They hate the leadership. They hate what's going on. But they know one thing. They can't stop doing what got them where they are. And we can't stop doing where, and and we can't have, we have to have faith to go forth, to go forward, knowing that we can overcome anything. There's the 80 20 rule. 20% Yep. 20% of us will make the difference yep. to save our country. I agree. 20%. I and agree. That may seem like a lot, but I believe that that 20% is growing because it's the 80-20 rule. 20% of us, 20% of us will literally keep this economy going just because of the pure will of the people despite whatever they throw at us. I totally agree with you, and I'll tell you what, never weaken, never step around, but when somebody steps in your face and says it's going to be a certain way, always remember to step over. Randy, God bless you. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, we better have a weather update right now. You know what? The fog is dissipating. There's a nice word. Dissipating. And I can see my neighbor's trees. Kind of pretty out there with all that frost on the trees. I can see across the river to Larry and Nancy Hudig's place. Yeah, way across the river. It's kind of pretty out there. Hey, it's time for the weather update. Brought to you this hour by Qualys Electronics. Oh, 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 oh. Have they got televisions for Super Bowl game this year? They've got a Samsung 51-inch plasma. Save $50 at $449. They've got a Samsung 60-inch LED. Save $200 for just $999. Oh, my goodness. Get in there today. And you know what? they got chairs. they got chairs sitting in there. And you can can just sit back and absorb all the different styles, all the different screen sizes, and you can go, Martha, I like that one there. And then she can say, well, listen, Fred, I like this one over here. And you can have a ball. It's great. 1730 Kimberly Road in Twin Falls, and that's, of course, Qualys Electronics. Super savings events going on right now for Super Bowl Sunday. Don't you miss it, okay? Here's Michael Rogers with the weather. 
No, 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 Michael Rogers from MichaelRogersWeather.com. We're changing our weather pattern for today. No change tomorrow. It's pretty much the same since the last seven days. So you're going to see a lot of sun. And very little clouds. You know, it would be nice if we get up, say, let's see. You know, what's a good number? 52. Yeah, 52 would be nice, but you're going to get up a high of 48 today. So enjoy the weather. It is the only weather you got. There you go. Alrighty, I will talk to you. <laughs> All righty, there was a voice that shocked me, and I think it shocked her, too. Gina had to get a little part of the weather, and she does a great job. Qualys Electronics, 1730 Kimberly Road in Twin Falls. Stop in and check out the super savings for the Super Bowl. It's going to be fantabulous at Qualys Electronics in Twin Falls. Calls are welcome and appreciated. 436 224 And, uh, Gina, I know that you're a Seahawks fan. I know that you and Randy uh, and many others in this area have waited with bated breath to have the Seahawks finally, okay. finally go to the Super Bowl. Second time in franchise history. Yes, I remember the first time. Let's see, it was when uh, Igor threw the first rock out of the cafe. Yeah, and uh, that we were up against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yes. So that was, uh, that was uh, hotly contested with the um, officiating of that game. Do you remember the quarterback? Um, Flynn. For you? No, I'm trying no, to... No, 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 it was Jimmy Zorn. Oh, was it Zorn? I think so, Yes. My brother will probably text me. And, and if it's that. not, if it wasn't Jimmy Zorn, I'll stand apologize. But uh, I'm positive uh, it was Jimmy Zorn, and he went on to do a lot of coaching and did a really good job. Um, but they, the first time wasn't very good. But this time they're going up against a Hall of Fame quarterback, Peyton Manning. I know. Now, I'm kind of torn because I'm a big, big Peyton Manning fan. Yeah. I the Denver Broncos. I was actually very, very sad when. He signed on with the Broncos. Well, you, here's a couple of pluses, though. I sat and I just loved to watch. I'm a defensive nut. I love defense. I'm not uh, as much on offensive by, as I am on defense. I honestly think that if Richard Sherman will keep his mouth shut and concentrate on the game, along with the other corners and safeties that they have, and a great defensive line, they can give Mr. Manning a lot of headaches, and quite frankly, yeah. I'm not uh, I'm not as afraid at all to pick Seahawks over the Denver Broncos. I think honestly, it's going to come down to a defensive game, and so uh, the Seattle defense they are on it. They have saved so many games, and so I think uh, the Seattle defense is really going to come into play when it comes to the Super Bowl. Did you happen to catch the game the other? Did you watch the game? I did. I, I listened to it on the radio. I oh. There was one play in particular, and for those out there that saw the game, they know what I'm talking about. I didn't get the guy's number, but the, he was on the offensive line, and there was a mix-up. There was a mix-up. And he's just about to get down in a three-point stance, and Kaepernick's up over center calling the play. And this guy from Seattle reached out with his right hand grabbed his own linebacker and literally threw him to the other side of him with one hand and I thought there's a man that you definitely want to say sir to 24-7, 365 I'm trying to remember who in the heck that was I don't remember oh I mean, I couldn't believe the strength. The guy was in the wrong place, and this guy reached out with that right hand, grabbed him by the jersey, and just literally threw him to the other side of him. And I thought, well, ping pong is a fun sport. <laughs> well, you know, uh, of course, you and I know that uh, football very, very tough sport, yeah. and uh, I am just impressed with uh, the defensive line for Seattle. And we've got a phone call. Quickly. Okay, good. Good morning. You're on the air. Yeah, this is the guy from the Midwest that's in snow and freezing, and uh, just wanted to make sure that you were having patience with those beautiful ladies you had out there. Well, my goodness sakes, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of my dearest friends, Dave Bego from Indianapolis, Indiana, and as Dave and I both share the same condolences, his team, the Colts, they are now sitting on a beach someplace and uh, watching the boats fly by or float by. My Green Bay Packers, heaven knows where all of they are, but... But uh, what do you think, David? Seahawks versus the Broncos. Where are we going? I think 
So I, I, I think it's going to be um, a good game, but I think the Broncos are going to win. You so do. How about you? I'm going to pick the Broncos purely because of Peyton Manning. Um, I think that there was a little negativity that was shown the other day uh, with Richard Sherman that created a bigger fan base for the Broncos, and I think that uh, the best thing that the Seahawk management could do is go buy a cheap dollar nineteen cent of duct tape and put it over Sherman's mouth and keep him quiet until after the game's over. <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty bad, wasn't it? I mean, um, that guy that guy needs to uh, uh, have a little um, instruction on how to handle himself after a game. You know, there's something to be said about being a good winner and uh, a good loser, too, you know? Well, you know, David, you've played a lot of sports, and I've played a lot of sports uh, before I lost my legs. And, you know, when you're a winner, you've won a very competitive contest. And I'll be the first to admit that some of these people, from whether it's ESPN or ABC Sports, it doesn't make any difference, running over in the heat of the moment and sticking a microphone in someone's face, you never know what you're going to get. It's easy to criticize sometimes the player in the heat of the moment. But, you know, his diatribe did nothing, did nothing but just lower his standards. And quite frankly, I think it hurt the standing of the Seahawks with the younger generation as far as their fan base. Well, I'm sure you're right. It was, it was way over the top. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I just go, are you kidding me? Um, and uh, But, you know, some people do that. And uh, I think uh, the young man, hopefully he learns a lesson and so do the Seahawks from that. You know, and I'll put another person at fault on this, and I'm not picking at her because I think she was a little dumbstruck as to what was going on. But I think reporters, sideline reporters, especially women, they need to be more cognizant. They need to be more aware. They absolutely need to be more prepared when they run into a situation like this because Aaron Andrews looked like somebody had just taken 100 flash cubes and shot them in her eyes because she didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say, or how to handle the situation. And I think it could have been diffused, actually, if she'd have taken control of that conversation. Well, possibly so, Zeb. I mean, that's a tough one for anybody. I think all of us would have been, uh, you know, in a state of shock at somebody. It's not often you see somebody come off like that. I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, you, you hear it more behind the scenes, but right there on national TV, right to a live interview, it's like, are you kidding me? Um and you just wonder if this guy has been like this his whole life and if people have addressed it. Well, he's not dumb. I mean, we should absolutely uh, be sure and give credit where credit is due. He's a Stanford graduate, very articulate, does a lot of work, and I will say this, does a lot of work with the underprivileged in uh, his hometown area. He grew up in a very, very poor status, uh, didn't have much, and pulled himself through the ranks uh, through his athletic ability to become an outstanding football player and achieve the greatness that he has now with the Seahawks. But that is all the more reason to be a 24-7, 365 role model and not let your uh, shotgun mouth overrun your BB gun brain. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. And uh, like I say, I, I, Zeb, I can't believe it's the first time. I'm sure that, you know, just from what I saw, that had to happen some, uh, in the past. And you would think somebody would step up and give him a little guidance and, and be a little bit of a role model for him. Because, uh, quite honestly, I've had people like that in my organization over the years that, that all of a sudden uh, step up and, and do something like that. And you, and you just look at him like, are you kidding me? And whenever I see that happen, I immediately get them and I get them alone. Well, you know, I don't embarrass them in front of a bunch of other people. And uh, close the door and sit down and say, why? That is not the way we conduct ourselves. we got to be professionals. And I don't care whether you're in sports or business or whatever you're in. You need to be professional and handle yourself with class. I agree, and that's the great way to wrap it up right there, the word class, of which you are exuding every time you're on this program. A very classy man, a dear friend. Dave Beagle, my goodness, thanks for calling in all the way from Indianapolis, Indiana. God bless you, and I'll be in touch with you. Okay, now you be nice to the girls now and have patience with them. That was supposed to be my message to you this morning. You've been talking to Deanne again. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. God bless you, man. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. All righty. There's one of my dearest friends back in Indiana, Dave Beagle. Been on this program many, many times. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. I've got about a minute left. Go ahead. Hey, I just, I just want to say a lot of the pro football players do this, but 
The, it seems like almost the whole Seattle team does it. When they make a catch, they celebrate like they just won the Super Bowl. When when a cornerback breaks up a play, he celebrates like he just won the Super Bowl. Uh, they're just doing their job. Well, why you got to get up and celebrate when you make a catch? Well, you know, there was a statement made years and years ago, and I think it was made by George Hallis, the uh, Papa Bear of the Chicago Bears, and uh, he had a player, uh, I want to say it was Willie Gallimore, that was playing running back for uh, the Chicago Bears. And Willie Gallimore did a bunch of kind of showboating in the end zone, and George Hallis took him aside and he said, Listen, young man, when you make a touchdown in this league, act like you've been there before. All right. Like Barry Sanders used to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sir, God bless you, and thank you for your call. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Don't forget our friends at uh, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you. My goodness sakes, the sun is popping through. It is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Mr. Rogers is not going to take off his sweater, however. And uh, all of your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers have got all the tires you're looking for. They've got all the tire chains. They've got all the batteries. They've got the best in brake service. They have, of course, all of your snow tires tires and all the different tread designs. They got the tires pinned for studs. They've got, like I said, the best in front end alignment, shocks and struts. What are you waiting for? Get into where the pros work daily serving you. Lane and Rupert, Dave on Blue Lakes and Twin, Mike and Buell, Mike and Jerome, the Twist family and Paul, John on Pauline and Twin Falls, and Randy on Overland in Burley. They are the best. Your Magic Valley, Les Schwab Tire Centers. Okay, now next hour, going to be really interesting because one of my favorite guests is going to be on the phone with us from back in Michigan, and that is Kyle Olson with EAGnews.org. We're going to be talking to him about education and what's going on, some of the frivolous things to where just throw money at it. Just throw money at it. It'll heal it up. And at 9.30, we're going to talk to Charlie Howell, my dear friend from Jerome County Commission. And we're going to be talking about everybody wanting to jump the Snake River Canyon all, this, all of a sudden. And then Dr. History. And then at 10.30 this morning, we're going to talk to the new president of the National Potato Council. Happens to be our neighbor right here and a really nice guy, Randy Hardy. So don't go away. I'll be back in six. I love that music. Man, I tell you what, I just that gets my blood pumping and say good morning everybody. How are you? Zeb at the ranch hour number two. I'm Zeb Bell along with our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you. And of course some of our great advertisers, including Lee's Furniture Floors and more with their I love my pillow. I do. I've got those memory foam pillows. Oh man. Don't go without one. Get in there and check it out today. You are going to be in La La Land. Love them. Lease Furniture Floors and More, 459 Overland and Burley. And then, of course, let's not forget our dear friends at Western Way Services. From the canyons of the Snake River and all across southern Idaho, we're rolling the Jordan Circle. Western Way I've got to get old Kelly back on the phone with us some morning here in the not-too-distant future and talk more about garbage, more about how to get rid of your garbage, and talk about Western Ways getting rid of your garbage. I mean, they know. I mean, they're the best. Always at your disposal. That's right. Whether it's a dumpster, they've got them in various sizes, or whether it's pot porta potties for a special event, or whether it's the route service. I mean, you can set your clock by those people. They're so efficient. Absolutely the best Western Ways services. Always at your disposal. Disposal call 734-6969. Before we go to our guest, I also want to remind you about our dear friends over at Handsome Mortuary. Oh my goodness, you know, Joel Heward and the rest of his staff really 
caring people. You look up the word caring in the dictionary, and yep, there's their pictures right there. They really care. Joel Heward and Hanson Mortuary, 710 6th Street in Rupert, and they're always committed to upholding the highest of ethical standards with unquestioned integrity. Why don't you take the time today, and uh, I know it's a little tough. I know it's a little hard to do this, but call and ask about pre-planning of funerals. You know, it's information that helps alleviate a lot of the stress and worry for our friends and families. 710 6th Street in Rupert, the number to call, 436-5636. Had some mortuary with Joel Heward. You call them today. Well, right now, I get a chance to visit with uh, a good friend of this program. He's been on many, many, many times, and I'm just blessed to have him. And that's, of course, Mr. Kyle Olson with EAGnews.org. And Kyle, simply put, we know the answer to education's problems. All we have to do is just throw money at it, and it's going to heal itself, right? That's right. Uh, yeah, because that's worked so well. Uh, when you look at what school districts are spending around the country, um, the answer invariably is more money. And it's great for the adults because it means higher pay and more pension, uh, higher pensions and better health care and all of those sorts of things. But it doesn't translate into student achievement. And to me, that's the whole purpose of a school. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up on next week is National School Choice Week. And to me, that's the solution, giving parents the power to pick um, what school or what environment uh, they want their children to learn in, whether it's the traditional public system or it's a charter school or a private school or homeschooling or online, whatever it is, parents should be making that choice. And just simply throwing more money at the problem is not doing anything. Yeah, but wait a minute. Here's my question to you. Let's say that you live in, oh, the suburbs of Detroit. Or let's say that you live in the suburbs of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or maybe Madison, or out in Irving, Texas, suburb of Dallas, and you're new to the area. How does one know? How does one ascertain the information to really find out what's best? I mean, you can be deluged with information you couldn't read the rest of your life sure well i mean what what parents need to do is they need to um not just sit back and assume that the local school district is you know is the best option but with technology today and you know search engines and everything i mean it's so easy to find schools in your community and i would encourage parents to do exactly what my wife and i did and we looked at all of the schools in our area uh, we visited, we talked with teachers, we talked with um, principals, we looked at, you know, what the school day was like and all of those sorts of things to figure out which sort of environment would best meet the needs of our child. Because ultimately, parents know how their child, uh, how their children operate, uh, their behaviors, their interests, um, uh, you know, how they will respond in different environments and those sorts of things. And so parents really need to take action uh, when it comes to where and how their children are learning. Now, I would imagine, uh, let's just assume it's a new family that's moving into a respective area. It doesn't make any difference if it's a Midwest or Southeast. It doesn't make any difference. I would imagine all of the above is applicable to finding and helping coerce the parents into finding the better school for their students. But, but, what about actual contact and conversation with other parents? How do you find parents that are reputable and are going to give you a good straight answer? Well, I mean, it, it, it um, you know, I think you can do that through a church. You can do that through, um, you know, sports that your kids play. Um, I mean, there's, you can, and again, there are ways um, with search engines and, and all of that, there are ways to identify people um, like that who have common interests, um, whether it's sports or a church or, or those sorts of things. Um, but I think... Uh, again, parents, the ultimate test is parents should look at the schools, um, you know, talk with parents that, that attend those different schools and ask them. Um, that's what it's going to take. And just just simply going to a school because that's where, you know, the, the school district or the local government assigns you is not a good enough way. And that's the way we, we've been doing this for, for decades. And um, it just is not the way that it should be operating anymore. Yeah. 
You know, when you sent me some information regarding the uh, Camden, New Jersey school district, and I got to tell you something, it knocked me right back on the back pockets of my Wranglers when I read that uh, 14 to 1 student to teacher ratio, and they're spending over $26,000 per student, uh, but things aren't so rosy there, are they? No. Uh, when students took the SAT last year, uh, literally three students in the entire school district um, scored as, quote, college ready. And so uh, Camden, uh, Rochester, New York, Buffalo, New York, um, there are school districts all across the country that are just dumping money, just throwing money at supposedly educating students, and yet it, it, that's not happening. And, uh, and so the other frustrating thing is to just see the, the, the bureaucracy, uh, the politicians, just, you know, they ask for more time. They ask for, you know, just give us some patience. We're, we're working this out. We have a new plan that we're going to work on, and hopefully that will fix the problem. They've been doing that for years. And so that's why, again, I think the solution is school choice and allowing the dollars to follow the child um, to the school that best meets their needs. Mm -hmm. And I think when that happens, when you're able to inject competition into the system and you put the needs of students and parents at the center of the equation, that's where you're going to see the paradigm shift and um, schools will be much more attentive to the interests uh, and needs of the students and the parents. And if they don't, uh, just like you know, a businesses, uh, stores competing for your business, if they aren't attentive to your, your wants and needs, then they are going to lose business or they're going to go out of business. And that's exactly the, the principle that we should be applying to schools. Absolutely. Now, of course, that when you mentioned the word competitiveness, you were, of course, referring to spending thousands of dollars to go bowling and also skating, right? <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, one of the, as we've been doing, uh, let me back up. So our organization has been looking at school spending for a while now um, around the country. We most recently looked at... Um, several districts in New Jersey and New York um, and in the, in the next couple this week and next week we're going to be looking at six more districts um, around the country Atlanta um, Rochester New York Jefferson County K uh, Kentucky which is Louisville um, other uh, Philadelphia other districts around the country to show taxpayers and parents where the dollars are going and um, and what we try and do is We'll look at these things and, and look at things that may be a little odd or questionable or, you know, just deserve follow-up. And so we'll ask, um, we'll ask these districts, you know, why did you spend X number of dollars traveling or X number of dollars at restaurants? And the Camden, New Jersey um, school district spent $24,000 on uh, bowling and skating for students. Mm. Now, when that happens, we typically will anticipate an answer like, well, you know, kids don't really have the opportunity to experience those sorts of things, and so we're going to use funds to do that. And, you know, that's debatable whether or not that's an actual, you know, there's, there's educational value to that. Um, but their reason when they came back was they said they took kids bowling to improve hand-eye coordination, and they took kids skating um, to uh, the same sort of thing, to... Um, uh, uh, improve uh, muscle coordination, and and then um, we asked why did they why did the Trenton New Jersey um, school district take students to a build a bear workshop, and they said because they wanted students to observe the needs of living things, and the, my thought was well this is a it's a teddy bear it's a stuffed bear I mean why wouldn't you either watch a National Geographic video or take kids to the zoo mm -hmm. or something like that where they could actually see a real live bear. Sure. Um, but unfortunately, that's the, that's the line of thinking. And I think that's the line of, that's why Camden, Trenton are in the situation that they're in, where they have huge dropout rates, um, uh, pathetic uh, graduation rates, 
and student proficiency um, where it should not be. Let me ask you this, Kyle, and I'm sure that you're way ahead of me and you've got your answer and you've probably had this question answer, asked so many times. But okay, we've got $24,000 that was spent on bowling alleys and skating rinks at um, Camden, and then we had another, I don't know how many thousands of dollars spent to go build a bear workshop. Why couldn't they, why didn't they, and why shouldn't they use that money to incorporate physical education classes into the school that's going to help benefit everybody? Right. Or why don't they double down on reading tutors or, yeah. or getting teachers um, who are, are highly effective at their job and are actually improving student learning? Um, I, I mean, it just it seems to me when you have graduation rates in the high 40s, when you have student proficiency rates in the 20s, it seems to me that should be your primary focus. It should be um, focusing on the basics um, and getting kids to um, acceptable proficiency levels before you start doing all of the extracurricular things. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I, I think school districts, they, they want to focus on everything, and they're neglecting the most basic things. And so... Um, you know, what we're trying to do with these reports is highlight these sorts of expenditures. We've got more coming. Um, we we released, uh, released a um, infographic on our Facebook page yesterday about uh, the Buffalo School District that spends millions of dollars every year on um, a cosmetic rider for mm. its teachers. And, mm. and so basically what that means is taxpayers pay for elective cosmetic surgery uh, for teachers. It's those sorts of things that are driving up the cost of education and not doing anything uh, to improve educational outcomes for students. You know, when you look at this, and there's nobody in the United States that's more knowledgeable about what's going on in education than you, if you were going to point your finger and gr uh, blame a group or an entity as uh, the most important and also the most liable that's not taking care of this problem, would you point your finger at the parents? You know, um, I would. I, I think parents certainly are to blame um, for a, a variety of reasons. Um, I think parents are too trusting um, that the local school district um, or the the so-called experts um, actually are. You know, are, well, one are ex experts, but then two actually looking out for the interests of their children. So. I mean, I, I, to some degree, I would blame parents, um, but we cover stories all the time of parents who are trying to do something and just are stymied by unions. They're stymied by uh, the bureaucracy um, that is, is more intent on protecting its, its control and its monopoly and its money and jobs and pensions and, uh, and, and protecting the system. And so... Um, you know, I, I believe that ultimately it's, it's the whole system that is seeking to protect itself um, and anyone that tries to get in their way, um, they will do what they can to mull them down. And yeah. I think that is, well, I know that that's demoralizing to parents. Uh, it's frustrating. And so uh, I certainly, uh, I think there, there, are, there is more that some parents can do. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that um, it's very difficult going up against the system um, to try and, and get what's best for their children. I was in the Salt Lake City Hospital last week uh, for some major surgery, and I overheard a conversation between two nurses. And it was really interesting, and it was in regards to Common Core education, and woo, it got a little testy. Uh, the one nurse calling Common Core the great healer of education, and the other calling Common Core the great divider in education. So there seems to be a lot of split decision and attitudes about what Common Core is and will do. Yeah, there really is, and uh, and what we're seeing around the country right now is states really taking a serious uh, second look at whether or not it's in their in their best interest. Massachusetts um, has delayed implementation by, uh, for two years. New York, the um, the state um, assembly speaker, has said that um, he believes the case has been made to repeal Common Core in New York. 
And so here we have progressive states that are saying, progressive states who, you know, generally are more trusting of the federal government. They believe in big government. They believe in, you know, all of those, uh, uh, all of those sorts of things. They are now second guessing these things. So um, we also saw we we ran a story yesterday about Nikki Haley, the governor of South Carolina. Mm-hmm saying she would sign a Common Core repeal, uh, repeal bill if it got to her desk. So we are seeing, I think, um, the, the, as implementation is occurring, we're seeing the, the wheels fall off the cart. And, and what people are seeing is that this, this centralization of education is not going to work. And this is a, this is a solution, quote-unquote solution, from the very same people who have created the problems to begin with. And so that's why I think it ultimately is not going to work. Uh, when parents hear more stories about the data mining and, uh, and the breaches of security and all of that that's going on around the country, uh, I think they're going to be even more turned off by it. And I agree. So I, I just I don't see this initiative. Um, you know, it, it will remain most likely in, in some uh, form, but I think we're, we're starting to see... Um, you know, the wheels fall off the cart. We have a caller with a question. Go ahead quickly, caller. I'm almost out of time. Go ahead, please. Yes, the other night we had a Common Core meeting. There was probably 250 people here in a small town of 10,000 people. Um, I, what was struck me was that I had friends on both sides of the issue, people I respected who were for it, and, and, you know, teachers, administrators, and then uh, parents on the other side. And, and I, it literally, our community is divided over this thing, and it, it's truly sh- uh, shocking to see it happen. But one of the things else, too, was that the children and the parents were divided because when the young student takes their homework to mom and dad for help, uh, the student says, well, mom and dad, we don't do it that way anymore. And then in some cases, the student even thought their mom and dad were stupid. And it's even divided the families, and I'll hang up. Uh, thank you very much, caller, and go ahead, if you would, please, Kyle, respond to that. Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it is, because in, we're hearing other stories just like that, where uh, the students will bring homework home, and the parents, uh, they know what the answer is. They know that, um, uh, you know, that 90 divided by 18 is 5. They know that. But Common Core now requires multiple steps in order to get to that answer. And it, it just is, it, it's, you know, stupid, frankly. And, um, but it's, it's, it's creating a, a lot of up, upheaval in the system, which I, I think the system certainly is broken and is, need, is in need of reform, but uh, Common Core is not going to do anything to fix that. Charlie, uh, it, what I think ultimately should be happening is, is states like Idaho and others around the country should be looking at their standards, evaluating whether or not they're, they're good, um, but to just assume that Common Core is going to save the day right. and the, the power shift to the federal government in Washington, D.C. is going to save the day, I think is, is wrong. And we're starting to see that play out around the country. Uh, one final question and short answer on this, Kyle. Uh, in a perfect world, what really now, as far advanced as we are basically on a liberal-style education with the Common Core and other aspects, What's it going to take to turn this thing around so that we have respect and possibly a better education system in public schools? Well, it's going to take uh, parents standing up, as we've seen around the country, um, parents being informed, like the the caller just talked about, um, taking an interest in their child's education or their grandchild's education, and uh, and doing something about it. And if they're if they're elected officials who aren't doing aren't heeding their concerns. Find somebody else that will. Um, that's what should be happening, and that's when we'll see um, a change occur. Absolutely. You are the best. Kyle Olson, eagnews.org. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and I'll be talking to you in a couple of days. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. He knows education, Kyle Olson, and he's been on many, many, many television shows, uh, regular on Fox News, and just a real sharp young man. Appreciate him very much. Talk about sharp guys. Well, we just happen to have a couple of them right there in Rupert with Cameron and Siemens Insurance. Mm-hmm. 
Dean and Todd, dedicated and responsive to your needs, and believe me, they're accessible and very devoted to serving others. They know all about life insurance. They know all about health insurance. They know all about retirement planning and employee benefits and service to you and your family and your business. Hey, they can help you. They will. All you have to do is call them at 436-4424. 436-4424. The best. Not bragging if it's true. It's true. The best. Cameron and Siemens Insurance serving you. Okay? Oh, by the way, you know, I've had some people call me and they say, what are you talking about? I love my pillow. I do love my pillow. New advanced technology memory foam is the secret. It's a little lighter. A little bit more supportive foam that sleeps the way I like to sleep. I like to kind of get in the middle of that pillow and just bury my head in that thing and create kind of a crevice around the outside and then bring the edges up. I know I sound weird, but that's the way I like to use my pillow. Well, you check it out, a super soft color, cover for cooler and more comfortable sleep. You're going to love it. You better get in and check these pillows out today and just say when you open the door, Open the door at least, furniture, floors, and more, and just say, Zeb loves his pillow. I want one to love, too. They've got them for you. Lee's Furniture, Floors, and More, 459 Overland and Burley. Stop in and see them today, okay? You'll love your pillow. Oh, my goodness sakes, what else have we got cooking here? Um... I want to remind you, too, that I had a public service announcement, and I dropped it, and I can't find it. <gasps> Who's me? But I'll uh, go ahead and give you this little commercial, and then we'll be all set to go with our next guest. Let's ride. Highway 24 between Rupert and Burley, and it is not going to be that much longer. I promised the end, I promised me, before I'm going to climb on that four-wheeler and we're going to hit the hills. Absolutely. And don't forget, you check out all the ATVs. They've got a selection over there that will knock your socks off. You open up the door to that showroom and you're going to go, <gasps> Martha, look at them. Unbelievable. And all the snow machines, all the accessories, great people there to help you, parts and service department, my goodness sakes, the best in the valley. They're open Tuesdays through Saturdays, 9 to 6. Let's ride. Highway 24 between Rupert and Burley, where the fun is sold. Well, right now, we're going to get on the telephone, and uh, we're going to talk to an old friend of mine, an old friend of mine that gets along about like I do because of age. You know, we're getting a little long in the lobe and gray in the, gray in the hair and long in the tooth. Here he is, your Twin Falls County Commissioner. No, he's Jerome County Commissioner. He's going to hate me for that. Well, he might find safety in Twin Falls. You never know. Here's Charlie Howell. I don't find safety in Twin Falls. I hate driving across that bridge. <laughs> How's my friend Charlie Howell doing? Uh, me personally, I'm doing pretty good. But yeah, can't complain. You know, the, the sun's out shining and the weather's decent, so yeah, can't complain. Now, what are you doing? Uh, you're going to make me feel bad here because uh, rumor has it that you've got horses at the vet, and the reason the horses are at the vet is that you're getting everything ready to go to Arizona, right? That's true, yeah. Um, actually, yes. <laughs> true. And you know, of course, what that does. Part now. You know what that does to me? It's like driving a stake through my heart. Uh, we're going to miss you this year, that's for sure. Well, I'm going to be missing uh, the whole activity down there. Charlie, what is going on? I mean, why is everybody all of a sudden so hell bent on wanting to jump the Snake River Canyon? Well, I think this is supposed to be the 40th anniversary of people jumping across the canyon, or, or actually evil, can evil attempting to jump the canyon, and I think everybody's just trying to celebrate his uh, anniversary in, in a couple of different fashions. Obviously, Scott Truax is involved with the first one, and so they want to do it in a different style, but to use the same machine, and, and then uh, Big Ed wants to do it from the original site. So it's, it's uh, quite unique that people want to do something that I wouldn't do. Okay, but now, jump in the canyon, all right? Now, that means that you've got to go from point A to point B. What's the distance from the north side to the south side, or conversely, south side to north side? I mean, what is the distance they have to travel? You know, I, that's a good question. I don't know that technical answer there. I know the one on the 
Scott's proposal to jump on the east side of the Hanson Bridge is shorter than it going across uh, from the ramp to Twin Falls' to the side. Okay. Now, here they're going to uh, kind of, I guess, what is it, stuntman Eddie Braun is going to be the one that's going to work for Scott Record and Scott Truax, right? Yes, he's supposed to be the one piloting the cycle, yes, okay. the rocket. Well, tell us a little bit about this rocket. I mean, like, are they going to have uh, nitroglycerin fuel that's going to put them in orbit for about 17 times around the Earth and then land over on the other side, or what's going to happen here? No, this, my understanding from Scott is this is the exact same rocket that Evil Knievel tried to jump the canyon with the first time. The only difference in the two is going to be the parachute uh, problem. They're trying to rectify that parachute problem. Uh, but other than that, it'll be the exact same same rocket. It'll be steam propelled, no adverse effects on the environment or anything like that. Okay. Now they're going to have a takeoff point on the north side, the Jerome County side, and land on the Twin Falls side, right? That's correct. He's got about 200 acres under lease for two years. Uh, Scott does, and going from north to south, and they figure it's a better jump because of the winds along the canyon and down the Magic Valley. Uh, so they just think, it, and it's more wide open, it's right there by Traveler's Oasis, it's better in and access, I guess you might say, in and out. So they, they're anticipating a lot less problems than Big Ed's has. Okay, now, what is going to create the, uh, the safety effect of being in this little missile, if you will, and your only hope and prayer of seeing daylight and possibly enjoying ham and eggs the next day for breakfast is that the parachutes work and you land softly? That, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, Big Ed did tell us exactly how he was going to jump and land. Uh, his is basically a big motorcycle that's aerodynamically uh, built for him, for a man of his size. And uh, But Scott is going to be, my understanding, is doing a parachute just like Evil was supposed to do. Okay. So now, uh, according to everything you've heard, now, are they going to have a test run on this? Are they going to have some kind of a test dummy? or uh, I mean, what's going to happen here? I'm not sure which dummy wants to jump in that cycle to test it, but uh, Scott has said in the past that he's going to have test test runs. Uh, I believe the term is a dry test run from this rocket about 30 to 45 days before his event. Uh, I don't believe Big Ed has told us. I don't remember if he said that during our meetings when he was going to test his. I see. Now, how about the counties themselves? I mean, how does the Jerome County and or Twin Falls County, how do they go about making any money off of this so it's worthwhile? Well, Jerome's a little bit different than Twin Falls. So both of Jerome's sites, uh, Big Ed site that he's going to land on is our Idaho Department of Land's property. And so we have, to a certain amount, no jurisdiction and no way to require fees other than bonding, insurance, uh, pay a lot of the costs that we think are, he's going to incur with the police, the fire, the securities, uh, things like that. And then, again, on Scott, that's all private land, again, from the north side. And so we really aren't, as a county, aren't involved in it to be able to charge you fees for using our quote, quote, area like Twin Falls is. So it's a little bit different process. I see. Now, have they set the dates on these jumps? Pardon? Have they set the dates? that it's going to happen? Um, I believe Scott is going to do September 1st. He changes date. He's like, they're like a week apart. And then as far as I know, Big Ed's still going to jump on the 7th or 8th. Okay. And uh, now what about how are they going to sell tickets? Or what, what's the situation going to be as far as co uh, crowd control? We haven't seen uh, Big Ed's application yet, but we've heard upwards you know, from forty to 70,000 people. Uh, Scott Truax has a permit from the county for 25,000 people, ticketed people. He'll sell tickets to the event. It'll be a four-day event. He's bringing in uh, country and western bands. He'll have camping along the uh, canyon there on that private property. And that's how he's going to make his money. And then as far as, you know, we're trying to make sure that all the county expenses are covered. Or, you know, our concerns of damage to private people's the people's private property, things like that. We're trying to put all those things in the ordinance that we're updating. Yeah, so no. it, it really is quite a logistic nightmare. I, I still don't see how they're going to do it, but as long as our costs are covered, 
We're okay. Okay, so now here you go, you uh, not you personally, because you and I are smarter than that because we're both team ropers. But uh, here you go, you cram some guy inside a little spaceship, and they have a countdown, and when it hits zero, a whole bunch of fuel is going to ignite right by this guy's butt. And it's going to shoot right. him, hopefully, high enough and long enough so that he's going to clear the canyon. And he could, I mean, if uh, the weather conditions are windy or something like that, he could end up over at the market on top of the roof over at Hanson, couldn't he? Oh, sure. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, and that's why Scott's very, they're worried about prevailing winds. That's why they don't have a definite time during the day of when they're going to jump. So their prevailing winds is what's going to determine what time of day that Scott jumps. Uh, Big Ed is a little bit different. He's actually riding a, a motorcycle with a long extended ramp, and then he's, uh, I don't recall, I wish I did, that how he's going to land. Well, now that brings up an interesting point. Um, I've heard Big Ed Begley, uh, Beckley when he was on the television one day and he had a resonant voice and everything, but one does not land a motorcycle and keep his voice so that he could sing with a Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. That, that, that'll be quite interesting. Yeah. So is he going to be on, like you said, a motorcycle, but is it going to be built like a rocket ship? I mean, he's not going to be able to fall off of that thing in mid-flight, is he? No, he'll be basically strapped in, and my understanding is it's a form-fitting motorcycle, so it's very uh, aerodynamically built, and it's built to his body frame and style, and and so he lays down on it, lays forward with his feet out the back. Okay, but you know, there's the problem. I mean, taking off the ramp, not a big deal. I mean, you got a big thrust, and all of a sudden you're airborne, and you're flying with the eagles, and you're enjoying the horizon. It's the coming down, Charlie. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yep. This is this is how are you going to soften the blow? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, where Scott's landing with a parachute, but I don't know how Ed's going to soften his blow. I don't. I know he explained that to us, and we've gone through so many different dynamics and meetings and discussions that I just don't recall off the top of my head. Oh. Well, now, do you think that they're going to complement each other? I mean, one going the week before the other, or are they going to hurt each other? I mean, what do you think about it as far as a promotion? Well, I think it's, you know, I mean, I don't know, that's not part of my business plan. To me, a business plan, you've got two separate events, so how that's worked for them, I'm not sure. But obviously, if it's up to their business plan of which one's going to jump first and how the one's going to interact with the other. Wow. And if, uh, like in Begley's case, if he asked you to go along and kind of a tandem deal, what, would you consent on behalf of the Jerome County Commissioners, or what would you do? Uh, I don't have a problem. I wouldn't jump it, but uh, I wouldn't have a problem on being there. I'm kind of, uh, September 1st is Labor Day weekend. Yeah. So that's the team roping weekend normally, but yeah, I guess if I got to be there, I'll be there. But I wouldn't want to jump the canyon, no. Do you think, Charlie, that uh, an event like this, uh, that Evil Knievel tried, what was it, 40 years ago, do you think that it still has the flair? Does it still have the uh, the public attention? Does it still have the the want to draw people in to see this? Do you think it's still going to be a drawing card? I think so, because they're trying to do some other events with it, not only just the jump, but some other events with it to bring the people in. Okay. All right. Well, i got to hand it to you, Charlie. There's not a dull moment being a county commissioner. No, that's true. It's always been fun and something new. Every time you think it's going to be mundane from day to day, it's something different. Okay, well, keep us posted on what's going on and let us know. By the way, while I got you on the phone real quick, how's the jail coming? Uh, jail's doing very well. We've hired our architect. He has had one meeting, at least, that I'm aware of with the sheriff to go over uh, square footage that's correct. Uh, some of the design problems that he saw in the original design, such as you know, ease of access, just like you do your house. Well, you want your living room over here, you want your doors to swing this way, and you'd be better off if you flop the uh, blueprint. So that's the preliminary stages. They should be having another week, uh, or meeting this week, I apologize. And uh, it's it's moving, and we're getting somewhere, but it's it's frustrating because it's so slow. But that's the way it is. So okay. if we break ground in 
July or August, I'll be impressed. All right. Well, my dear friend Charlie Howell, I mean, when it comes to jails or when it comes to people jumping canyons, he knows everything. Charlie, God bless you, man, and have a wonderful time in Arizona. Thanks. And one mention that we are, the commissioners are supporting a meeting with Scott Truax for the public uh, Anderson campground. It is February 19th, Wednesday night. Uh, unfortunately, that's the week I will be in Arizona, but that's what they got it scheduled for, and the public is invited to come listen to Scott to make his presentation and voice their concerns. I don't know exact time. I'm assuming 7 p.m., but I can get you that information back. All right. Well, Charlie, God bless you, man. Thanks a lot. And I know you're uh, hustling and bustling all over the place this morning, taking care of things, getting ready to go on a well-deserved vacation. But thanks for talking yeah. to us this morning. Standing here watching my horse get x-rayed. There you go, man. Well, listen, God bless you. And I've had plenty of x-rays myself the last couple of days. God bless you. Thanks much. I bet. Thanks, Ed. All right, Charlie. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. I mean, wow. I, when Evil Knievel did that way back 40 years ago, I remember vividly, and, of course, Gina was, what were you, Gina, one year old when they did that Snake River Canyon jump? She's when was it, 1972 or something? I think it was. I don't, see, that's how up I am on it. I don't have the exact date. I think it was 1972, but I'm not sure. I think if it, it was, was. 1972, depending on the time, I probably wasn't even born yet. I remember my mom and dad were here, okay? And we drove up into the South Hills and watched the fiasco with binoculars from right there. Had the uh -huh. best seat in the house, really. You know, um, I've, I've seen the videos, of course, uh, you know, on uh, YouTube and stuff. Phenomenal jump, uh, but I wasn't alive when it happened. Well, you know, this big Ed Beg Begley or Beckley or whatever his name is, he's not a little kid. I mean, this guy's got some pretty good size to him. Yes, he does. And yes, he does. he's going to be riding a, a motorcycle. And then the other guy, the stuntman Eddie Braun, is going to be like in a rocket ship. Now, I pose the question to you. A very conservative, smart young lady, would you cram your body inside one of those rocket ships to jump the canyon, really not knowing how the landing's going to go? Um, no, I probably wouldn't. Number one, I'm afraid of heights. Number two, I don't have that um, that much insurance on me, so um, no. <laughs> uh, scares me. Uh huh. All right, let's have a weather update while we consider our landing. Here's Michael Rogers weather. Michael Rogers from MichaelRogersWeather.com. We're changing our weather pattern for today. No change tomorrow. It's pretty much the same since the last seven days. So you're going to see a lot of sun. We're very little clouds. You know, it would be nice if we would get up, say, let's see. You know, what's a good number? 52. Yeah, 52 would be nice, but you're going to get up high at 48 today. So enjoy the weather. It is the only weather you got. There's Michael, the best weatherman in the world. Thank you for that weather update. Now, I'm reading a little bit about this thing and about cramming myself. First of all, I'm claustrophobic, and Gina didn't mention that as one of her tributes, but it no, is mine. I'm not really, I'm not a very claustrophobic type of person. Oh, guy. I am. I, I had an MRI once, you know, over at Burley not too long ago, and I told mm -hmm. you about that. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine cramming yourself into this rocket, okay? And they got to get all the hype. They've got to get all the buildup. They've got to get everything tested. They got to make sure the pressure's just right. They got to make sure that the fuel's just right. And you're crammed inside that little bitty rocket, maybe for what, thirty minutes? I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it. Um, and of course, then again, you have to make sure that all of the parachutes are going to work, and all of your safety mechanisms are going to work, and. And for me, in my mind, and I'm sure that he has a phenomenal team behind him and making sure and doing the checks and the double checks and the triple checks, still, it's that what-if factor for me, and, and that's what scares me the most. So I'm a wussy. Here's the guy. His name's Bernie, okay? And he's your parachute packer, and he goes out on a wild party the night before. I'd want to make sure I had complete control of Bernie, wouldn't you? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> I can't do this kind of stuff. And to, for, for two people to do this jump or a similar jump a week apart, that's really odd, I think. Oh, yeah, I think that uh, aren't we coming up on the anniversary, yeah. like a, the, the big milestone yeah. anniversary, and so that's yeah. why they're wanting to revisit this issue? Yeah. Well, I wish them well, but... Uh, 
Good luck. Yeah. I'll Not see for see me. See on the other side, man. Yeah, see on the other side. That might have a vast <laughs> meaning. <laughs> it might. <laughs> Calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. Deanne's handing me a note. Got it. Thank you, Deanne. I appreciate that. Give us a jingle on the landline, 436-2244. Love to hear what you... Would you climb in one of those rockets? Really, would you climb on one of those motorcycles and go off the ramp like at the Evil Knievel site in Twin Falls, and try to shoot for the other side. Now, you've got to be up in the air. Holy cow, what? Maybe 1,000 feet or more? I don't know. In order to get the right distance and everything, and you're up there on that cycle holding on the handlebars going, <whistles> sure hope the landing works. Not this kid. And in a missile, aren't you going to be leaving the pad with your head towards the front end and then coming down on your nose? I don't know. I have to study this a little bit. Give me a call, 436-224-1866-927-4587. Oh, did you hear about Mario Como from New York? This guy is one of those elite liberal snobs. He is very elite, he's very liberal, and he is a snob. We're going to talk about him in just a moment. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Hey, there, Bob. I think that, you know, this jumping the Snake River Canyon business, I've literally been down in, I mean, just literally all over the country talking to people, and I'll say, well, I'm from, you know, I say I'm, I say I'm from the Twin Falls area because, you know, they wouldn't know where Burley was unless it was just some coincidence, but I said, I live where evil can evil jump the canyon, and even if they're young, they say, oh, I know where that is. Or they know about the evil kid, evil jump in the canyon. It was such an event that uh, it, it had been passed down through the generations, obviously, because some of these people weren't alive when it occurred. And I was just a young man. And uh, so huh, it, 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 I think it will have a, that kind of effect again. Oh, I agree. You know, as a matter of fact, you, you just uh, triggered a thought when we were over at Spain in 2002 and I was announcing the World Equestrian Games. Uh, there was a gentleman over there that spoke excellent English and he was with the uh, Queen's Entourage and he asked, he said, what part of uh, Idaho are you from? And I said, we're down in the southern part. And he said, we're about, and I said, Twin Falls area and Burley area. And he looked at me and he said, isn't that where Evil Knievel tried to jump the canyon. And I thought, yeah, I mean, holy cow, you're right. Everybody seems to remember that. Well, that's the reason why I think that the impact will be uh, as big as it was. Now, forgive me for not knowing better, but are there going to be two people jump the canyon? Two different guys? Yeah, two different jumps. <laughs> See, I always thought they were only going to allow one to jump, and they were trying to decide which one. Oh, well, that shows me. I, it's just something I hadn't really paid any attention to. Yeah, we got, uh, we got... The potato jumping from the drone side to the twin side. Hey, think about it this way, and then I'll hang up. Remember how uh, Evil Knievel uh, built the ramp out of dirt? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and he said, so we were thinking, as young men driving around, you know, speculating teenagers, I said, well... What is he going to do? Is he just going to hit that baby about 200 miles an hour and fly over the canyon? Because why would you have built that ramp in the first place if your initial intentions weren't to just hit it high speed and hope you make it? But then he ended up changing his mind and doing the, you know, the jet propelled bike. You see, it was almost like he didn't even really have a good plan in the beginning. Yeah, you see, now this, now you've touched on it. Now you have said the secret words and the cow dropped down with the word that hands us a check. Uh, planning. I want to make sure that whether it's uh, with Scott Truax and Scott Record with their uh, evil, their stuntman's name is Eddie Braun. He's going to cram himself into a little missile. 
And then the big guy from Texas, this Beckley, is going to sit on a motorcycle and jump the canyon. Now, to me, there's no planning that is thorough enough or uh, is condensed enough that's going to put my fat body into a tube of a missile and fly off that ramp head first to land head first out in the desert. There's got to be some better planning than that. Oh, that, oh that's the why we'll all show up, see? I mean, did you see the first jump? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was so crowded, I was on the freeway uh, directly in front of it on the you know, I-84, uh, eastbound, parked there along the side of the freeway. That's where I had to look, jump, you know, check it out because there was no room. To get anywhere. I can just imagine the guy in the missile. Okay, here's the guy in the missile, and this is radio control. And the guy outside is going, ladies and gentlemen, 10, 9, and then all of a sudden there's a break in on the radio, and he says, Stop, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's gonna be crazy. Well, it'll be fun, and it'll be good economics for, uh, you know, boost and, uh, and hopefully too, not too many hell's angels will show up, huh? Well, yeah, there might be a lot of angels there. <laughs> oh, man, it'll be a wrap. Okay, see you then. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. No, man, after you've been in that uh, little confined missile for a while and the guy's going, 10, 9, 8. Uh, uh, stop for a minute, guys. we got to have a little break. <laughs> I couldn't handle that, being locked in a missile for Pete's sakes. Or sitting on the motorcycle, sitting on a motorcycle, looking across the canyon, 500 feet down, and the rocks, and, and the water, and knowing that you've got to land beyond that. <sighs> Not this cowboy. Calls are welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. Good morning, you're on the air. Yes, I just wondered if you had a comment on this business with uh, Chris Christie. If I, hang up. if I had a what? Gina, I didn't... Comment about Chris Christie. Oh, Chris Christie. I'll make a comment about Chris Christie. I think Chris Christie is living on... Uh, he's sleeping on eggshells right now. As big and heavy as he is, he's sleeping on eggshells. And when I say that, his whole political career could fracture at the drop of a hat. Whether it's the issue between uh, the transportation on the bridge, whether it's about the Sandy funds, the Hurricane Sandy funds that were withheld possibly to one mayor of one town. Chris Christie, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to be very blunt and say I don't believe him. I, I believe there was much more involvement uh, than what he lets on. I think he's in a lot of trouble. I think that with the investigation, the word's going to come out, and I think we may see the political demise of this man. That's just purely my opinion. If it is covered up and it goes on to the point where he does make the presidential, uh, maybe the finals, Maybe the finals as being the hot ticket number for the Republicans. Don't you think for a minute that there's not going to be a lot of people out there with shovels digging all the dirt they can about Christie? I think he's put himself in a real precarious situation right now. And I think there's a lot of mud out there that's not dry. And look out, Chris Christie, because I think there's some problems. Okay, quick question on my end on this one. Do you honestly think that he knew about it before it happened? The bridge incident? Yeah. Absolutely. And here's why, Gina. If you follow this man's track record, Chris Christie's track record, his belligerence, his being obtuse, his being a bully, his being in complete control, his being obnoxious, his being a take charge guy when it's at press conferences or whatever, don't you talk until I'm done, you sit there and shut up in that kind of an attitude. Mm -hmm. I honestly think that somebody wronged him that shouldn't have wronged him, and I honestly, in my honest heart of appraisal of this situation, think that Chris Christie is as guilty as sin. And this is what uh, amazes me about this this whole entirety of uh, this particular bridge gate. Uh, if you were going to be part of this, why on God's green earth would you send out electronic emails that can be traced? Yeah. 
You know, it's always easy, as you know, Gina, uh, you look at the underlings are always the ones that are brought to the forefront as creating the problem. But you've got to remember in management, management goes down, management doesn't go up. Uh -huh. And I honestly think that in the case of uh, the funds that were going to be going to this one city, and especially over the Bridgegate problem, knowing Christie and his personality, he probably sat there in his desk and he says, you know, that guy is not going to show me I'm the governor and I'm going to shut his traffic down and make life miserable for him. And that's my own honest uh, opinion. Uh, uh, and, and what I'm uh, flabbergasted about is did, did the backlash... Uh, that was going to come, did that not even enter into his mind? Did he not have the forethought to really think everything through well, then, before he actually went through it? Then answer this question. When you're talking about politicians, then why did Bill Clinton do the stupid things he did with the blue dress and, the, and Monica Lewinsky? <laughs> I mean, I, I realize that all of these are rhetorical questions, but these are the things that go through my mind. Well, obviously, they were not thinking. They act on passion. They act on impulse instead of really thinking well, things. And you know the personality. I know i got to go, but you know the personality of Chris Christie. He's very belligerent, very boisterous, and very pugnacious. Yes, he is. And I don't think that that's going to help him in any sort of way, especially if... I don't even think he's going to probably get out for a presidential bid. I, I, think, he, I think he's done. At this point in time, he's done. That's the way I feel. Yeah. We're on the same page. Hey, i got to run, literally, well, it's figuratively. Uh -huh, uh -huh. See you later. Okay. All right. Welcome back. Hour number three. Zeb at the ranch on a Tuesday. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And uh, we'd like to say thank you to our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations. Thank you very much, along with uh, Lee's Furniture Floors and more at 459 Overland in Burley. I love my pillow. I do. And Western Way Services, always at your disposal. Be sure and get on the route service today. Call 734-6969. Also, I want to remind you, too, about the Chadwick Sports Grill. Mm, you just want to go in and have a nice place to eat and visit with your friends. Mm, it's delicious. The atmosphere is great. And today's special for just five ninety five: a half French dip sandwich, fries or tots, super salad. <gasps> Good. Good. Just good eating. I mean, enjoy a day. Just go in and say, I'm going to enjoy my day, and I'm going to go to the Chadwick Sports Grill, 139 West Main in Burley. You'll have a great day. Okay? Speaking of having a great day, I haven't had a chance to... When's the last time I talked to this guy? I think I tried last Tuesday, but I was so loony, I didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, let's right now say good morning to the one, the only, Dr. History. Good morning, Zeb. You're sounding a little more like yourself. Oh, boy, the world's in trouble. <laughs> Last week, you were just a little off. <laughs> well, I was uh, not feeling too good. I, I could tell. Yeah. It was too <laughs> soon. better today, though, it sounds like. Too soon to come back after surgery. The doctors told me, don't do your program for two weeks. But big dumb me, I knew better. Yep, yeah, you tried. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> failed. <laughs> you did all right. <laughs> uh, anyhow, how's my friend? I'm doing great. I'm doing good. Good, good. Now, in matters of historical value, I'm sure that you have burned the midnight oil. I'm sure that you have probably gone through 37 sets of candles. I'm sure that Kim's put a lot of work in overtime. What's going on with today's program? Okay, you probably don't remember because you were a little out of it last week. Oh, well, thank you but very you much. You asked me one of my favorite stories, and I, or, or whatever, and I said or men, and I said uh, John Johnson, or as a lot of people remember him, Jeremiah Johnson. Absolutely. I remember that like it happened to a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, so that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Jeremiah, or his name really was not Jeremiah. His name was John, well, it wasn't even John Johnson, but I'll get to that. Okay. I mean, from history, you know, it's often difficult to separate legend from reality, and that's kind of the case with the story of this infamous American mountain man by the name of John Johnson. Now, it's certain that throughout his life he was known by many names, but most famously he became known as Crow Killer and or Liver Eaton Johnson. 
Well, those are those are good names uh, yeah. that if you're going to have a family gathering and you can say, hello, Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Mr. Schwartz, I want you to introduce to uh, Liver Eaton Johnson. Yeah, and uh, we'll get to that part, too. Okay, so. all right. Now, his real name, he was born in New Jersey, and his, actually his last name was Garrison. And his parents were Isaac and Eliza Garrison. He had five sisters, and they also have had a brother who died in the, in the Civil War. But they were of Irish or Scottish descent, we're not sure. But Johnson's father was an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And he nearly worked uh, young Johnson to death. Uh, his dad was brutal. Uh, he, and Johnson was just young, kind of a hopeless young man. And, um, you know, and maybe his dad being so rough on him helped him... Uh, to be capable of uh, toughening him up a little bit. So, mm-hmm. I mean, his dad would send him uh, to farms to work off his debt. <laughs> but uh, Johnson got tired of this treatment, and he began to work on a coastal schooner hunting whales. And he was actually a sea for about 12 to 13 years. And this is where he developed uh, a pretty powerful set of muscles, mm-hmm. big guy. Okay. Uh, but during the Mexican-American War, he served aboard a fighting ship, and... He enlisted under another false name. We don't know what that was. But after hitting an officer, which was not a good thing to do, he deserted, changed his name to John Johnson, and this is when he traveled west to try his hand at the gold diggings. And he ended up in Alder Gulch, Montana. And he also became a wood hawk, which I didn't know what that was, but that's where you supply cordwood to steamboats. Oh. Okay. And he was a described as a big guy. He was about six foot two in the stocking feet, weighed about two hundred and sixty pounds, and described as having no body fat. Oh boy! So you know he he could have been a pretty good football player. Yeah, played for the Rams for seven years. <laughs> he probably did. <laughs> uh, but you know, rumors and legends and campfire tales around about Johnson, uh, and perhaps the chief one among them is in 1847, his wife, a member of the Flathead. Indian tribe was killed by a young Crow brave and his fellow hunters, and this is what prompted Johnson to embark on his vendetta against the tribe. Now, let me ask you this before we go along. Okay. Now, you, of course, have seen the movie Jeremiah Johnson. Right. It's one of my very favorite produced movies ever. Now, as you know the history, and you know the person, and you know the, uh, the events, keep us informed as to how true the Hollywood version really was. Okay, I'm just going to say this. They cleaned up the movie compared to the book. Really? Yeah. Oh, my. Yep. Uh, Robert Redford didn't, uh, they didn't show him doing some of the things that the real Johnson did. Oh, okay. So, uh, like I say, he, uh, he set out on a vendetta against the Crow tribe, and legend says that he would cut out and eat the liver of each man he killed. Mm. Now, this was an insult to Crow, because the Crow believed that liver, the liver to be a vital uh, if one was to go on to the afterlife. I see. And so this led to him being known as Liver Eaton Johnson. So the story of how he got his name was written down by uh, people that actually kept diaries back then. And um, so that's kind of where he got his nickname of Liver Eaton Johnson. I see. <clears throat> but uh, like I say, he had changed his name to John Johnson. And as he headed west, uh, he uh, hooked up with an old uh, trapper by the name of John Hatcher. And this was the old guy that he kind of, uh, he was an experienced mountain man uh, with, you know, some uh, reputation. But he took Johnson to his cabin on the Little Snake River in northern Colorado. And there he taught Johnson the trapping, hunting, survival skills that a mountain man needed in order to live and profit. Well, Johnson, he caught on quickly. He proven himself handy with his thirty caliber hawk and rifle and, and a boy knife. And... Uh, when Hatcher quit the mountain manning trade several years later, why Johnson took over the cabin, and he set out for the Bitterroot Valley of Montana. Now, a year earlier, a flathead Indian subchief had offered his daughter to Johnson in trade. Well, Johnson made the exchange, and he and his new wife set off to return to his cabin on the Little Snake River. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> now, during the journey of several weeks, uh, Johnson had his wife begin to uh, teach him the, it's called the Salish language of her tribe, out of respect for her, and so he could communicate. And he taught her how to use a rifle so that she could hunt uh, to feed herself during the winter and while he was away. And this was typical uh, of what happened with uh, men and their Indian wives. Okay. But once they arrived at the cabin, it was early autumn, Johnson spent the rest of the season putting together a 
supply of dry goods for her winter stay, and then he set out to do his trapping. Well, when he returned to his cabin the following spring, and again, this was typical of how they did it. They trapped during the winter. He was met with a pretty gruesome sight. Mm. I mean, here was the remains of his wife, really not more than bones laying there because they'd been exposed for several months. Oh, and my. They were lying in the cabin's open doorway, and it was also uh, evident that it, she had been the victim of a crow hunting party. Oh, no. Now, even worse, among her bones was a smaller skull, that of his unborn child. Oh, dear. About probably seven months pregnant when mm-hmm. she was killed. Mm-hmm. Now, at this point, uh, Johnson tracked down a band, uh, and, and this was num- a, month, a few months later, but he tracked down a band of 50 crows, and uh, he uh, snuck up on them. He killed the guard, scattered the horses. The guard that he killed had a scalp. Well, it was his wife's scalp. Oh, no. I mean, you know, you can imagine what's going through his mind, but he knew that he'd at least killed the Indian that had killed his wife. Mm-hmm. And But he knew that there was more than one that had helped kill his wife. Well, so uh, soon the scout bodies of Crow warriors began to appear throughout the northern Rockies and the plains of Wyoming and Montana. And each time, each one had his liver cut out and... Uh, was also scalped, and uh, the liver was presumably eaten by uh, Johnson. Oh, my goodness. So eventually other mountain men and Indians learned of Johnson's uh, vengeance slayings, and again, he, this is where he picked up the name of liver-eating Johnson, or uh, also the name of Crow Killer. Mm-hmm. So he was waging a mortal, solid, one-man solitary battle against the whole Crow tribe, and and basically, they were getting afraid of him. I mean, there was no cruel warrior that was safe from him. Now, right there, stop, because, you know, you're talking about one guy. You're talking about one individual out in the wilderness uh, with the entirety of the Crow Nation uh, around him, circling him, etc., and you got to admit that the odds definitely weren't in Johnson's favor. Right, and, and this is probably where the movie uh, is a little more accurate, uh, because time and time again, uh, it would show him being uh, maybe attacked by an Indian, or he would come upon an Indian, or uh, and uh, he was able to survive. Mm-hmm. And uh, for a one-man army, if you want to call it that, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but again, here's a guy that's six foot two, just as powerful and strong. I mean, he could he could throw another man probably twenty feet. I mean, he was that strong. Holy cow. He must so, have been to your bodybuilding school. <laughs> he was. I mean, just a, an amazing guy yeah. uh, physically, you know. But anyway, many more deaths followed. And in time, the Crow tribe, uh, one of the, the mothers of one of the chiefs, decided to handpick their 20 best warriors and send them on a mission to hunt down and kill Johnson. And basically, not one of the warriors returned in fact, uh, it got down to the 19 of them were never returned. Well, the 20th Indian uh, snuck up on Johnson's camp while he was out doing something. Well, uh, Johnson and his, uh, he did have a partner with him at this time, and they were cooking biscuits. And this was in the wintertime, and this crow warrior went into their camp, and he was hungry, so he started eating these biscuits, while Johnson was down by the creek washing or something, well, Johnson caught the crow in camp, and that was the last of the 20. Mm. Now, did all of this take place uh, like the movie portrayed uh, along the Wasatch Front? Well, you know, it talks about northern Colorado and up into Utah and maybe a little into Wyoming. Uh, so, yeah, I think it did. Okay. Uh, all right. It doesn't specifically say exactly where all this happened. So. Okay. But uh, anyway, even after that, Johnson continued to kill uh, uh, Crow warriors. But there was one story that uh, they talked about where he was ambushed by a group of Blackfoot warriors. And this was right in the middle of winter. And uh, anyway, he was on a trip to visit his flathead uh, Indian uh, relatives. Um, But anyway, the Blackfoot uh, Indians, they uh, planned to sell him to the Crow. Um, which they knew was his enemy. Oh, so uh, they captured him. 
Yeah, the Blackfoot Indians oh, captured him, and I see. they were going to sell him to the Crow Indians, knowing that they could probably get a pretty good price for him. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, they stripped him to the waist, tied him with leather thongs, and put him in a teepee with only one a very inexperienced guide guard. And that was a mistake. Kind of a Barney Five type? Yeah, yeah. You know, don't let him have a gun yeah. or something. But yeah. Johnson managed to chew through the straps uh, that held him. He knocked out the young guard uh, with a kick, took his knife, scalped him, and then, and I hate to ruin your lunch, <clears throat> but he cut off one of his legs. Okay. Now, he made his escape into the woods, and he survived by, and this was in the wintertime, by eating the Blackfoot's leg. Mm-hmm. And I you, you like that. You've done a lot for the restaurant business in the area. Thank you so much. <laughs> but anyway, he actually traveled about 200 miles. I see. Now, that was a big well, leg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the leg it goes a little farther than that, uh, literally. <laughs> he actually was hiding in a cave one night. He went to sleep, and he woke up with something pulling on his arm. Uh, don't tell me it was the guy's toes. <laughs> no, it was a mountain lion. <laughs> and he used, he used this guy's leg as a club and chased the lion out of the cave. Okay, so then he heard some heavy breathing. Oh, uh, now wait a minute. Now where are you headed? Okay, sure enough, he'd wake, wake, woken up a hibernating bear in the cave. Okay, now what about right. the leg? Where does the leg come in? Okay, so he whacked the bear with the leg. Uh-huh. Until the bear just turned around, went back, and went to sleep in the cave. You're telling me that a hibernating bear woke up, he's got an Indian leg a thumping on him, and the bear says, ah, well, I've seen this story before, and he turns around and goes back to sleep. Yeah. And, and now, who he, documented all this? Well, like I said, sometimes things get a little fuzzy with time. A little fuzzy? <laughs> You've got a box of cotton there. <laughs> <laughs> well... And the thing that's odd is he went back to sleep in the cave and waited till morning before he left. With the bear? With the bear. <laughs> so, he wasn't the brightest guy in the world. Yeah, but, you know, he was tough. And Now, another time he was attacked actually by 20 Blackfeet Indians, and he actually killed 17 of the Blackfeet. Mm. So, now, another time he was attacked by a bear. He stabbed the bear in the heart, and then he ran and climbed a tree and waited for the bear to die. Okay. <laughs> now, he had to be pretty agile, I'm thinking, you know, to do that. Well, at 6'2", 260 pounds, strong as a bull, yep. I mean, this guy, what was his life expectancy? How long did he live? Well, we'll, we'll get to that. Oh. I'll tell you. Uh, okay, now, here we get uh, down the road a ways. There's a chief by the name of Gray Bear of the Crow. Uh-huh. And him and 26 of his braves were camped near a stream, and he went to get a drink, and as he was kneeling down to get a drink, Johnson rode out of the brush on his horse. Well, the Indian, of course, thought this was the end of him, but Johnson had his palms, the palms of his hands out, uh, which is a universal sign of peace. And he said that he was there to end the feud with the Crow Indian. So... Basically, the chief and Johnson made peace, and they actually kind of became his brothers, and his personal vendetta against them finally ended after 25 years, and we really don't know how many Crow Indians had fallen to him. But, you know, the West it was still a violent place, and the, a lot of Plains Indian War still going on into the mid-1800s, and there were still a lot of Indians with uh, of different tribes, uh, uh, the Sioux, the Blackfoot, all those guys. And uh, anyway, Johnson actually joined the Army in St. Louis in 1864. He was a scout for General Miles and, and actually helped in the capture of Chief Joseph. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. How old was the guy then? Okay, let's see. Um, I was trying to see if he, I can see where. I mean, he's not exactly a spring chicken. Right. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see where he. Uh, he died actually uh, age 76. Holy moly. 1899. So Whoa. at this point, he's got to be, what, about uh, 35 or so in 1864? Okay. So, like I say, he helped in the capture of Chief Joseph. He was honorably discharged the next year. And then during the 1880s, he was actually appointed deputy sheriff in Montana in one town and then a marshal in Red Lodge, Montana. 
So, but throughout his life, he was a sailor, a scout, a soldier, a gold seeker, a hunter, trapper. He was a whiskey seller. He was a guide. He was a deputy. He was actually a judge at one time. He built log cabins. Uh, he did anything he could to make a living. Yeah. So, and he, and he was... December 1899, at age 76, uh, the Crow Killer was admitted to a veterans hospital in Los Angeles, and he died January 21st, 1900. That's actually today, isn't it? January 21st. Yeah. And he had lived a long, you know, adventurous in life, and his story was passed on through generations, and, you know, while some of these things may be hard to verify, uh, and no doubt some of the stories were improved upon over a century of telling and retelling, and but his body was actually buried in Los Angeles in the Veterans Cemetery. Uh, however, there was kind of a six-month campaign led by a bunch of... Uh, uh, seventh grade students and their teacher, and they actually got his body relocated to Cody, Wyoming. Why? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Um, but they've actually, uh, on his grave, I saw a picture of that. They've got a, a picture of him on horseback, or not a picture, but a, a statue. Yeah. And and in that that uh, Buffalo Bill Museum there in Cody, mm -hmm. if anybody ever goes in there, there's a glass enclosed case that's got, I think, a gun, his gun and his knife, or a hatchet, I can't remember which. Really? That are, yeah, that are uh, supposed to be his, and they're on display there in that museum. I've got to check that out. I have got to check that out. Yeah, I was, in, I was amazed, because uh, they had it in a glass-enclosed case, and they said it was his. And, again, I'm not quite sure why Cody Wyoming got him. You'd almost think Montana would have been a more likely place to well even the state of utah though yeah yeah because now the state of utah they did what i think almost 90 percent of the filming of the movie jeremiah johnson was filmed along the wasatch front all the way down to st george yeah i believe so yeah um, yeah and you know i don't know if that's significant to his real life or not other than you know, Utah had the snow and the scenery, I guess. For well, did he ever really have a friend that was the guy that was scalped that rode with him for a while? Yeah, his name was Del Q-U-E. And I want to say Goo, I think they pronounce it Del Goo. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was a trapping partner. Um, and so they, they hung out together a, a bit. And then uh, some people may remember the story of the crazy woman. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And... Uh, he would check in on her occasionally, and uh, actually when she died, this is one thing that kind of brought Jeremiah or John Johnson to make peace. Um, when she died, some Crow Indians went in and uh, took care of her body and buried her um, in a very respectful manner. No. Oh. And, and this was, and she was kind of a friend of Johnson, even though she was, you know, the crazy lady. Yeah, she was the one that had lost her family, and I think Johnson came by, and she was out on the hills all by herself and everything. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, I think yeah. so. And then yeah. I, I think he built a cabin, I can't remember, yeah. for her. Holy cow. Yeah, That's still one of my her. favorite stories, the way you do that story about Jeremiah Johnson. And yeah. at the end of the movie, they say, he's up there, and he <laughs> always will be. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because one of the things I was reading is that Sometimes people will go up into the mountains where he was, and they swear they can hear him walking around up yeah. the mountains. Yeah. You did a great job again, Doc. I mean, what are we going to do? We can't keep bragging on you every week, but you get better and better. <laughs> well, that's a fun story. I, that, like you, that's one of my favorites, uh, you know. And I thought Robert Redford did a great job on that movie. Yeah, you know what? Honestly, it was, besides Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the only two movies that I enjoyed Robert Redford, because I knew he was a tree hugger, but I liked him in both those movies. Yeah. 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 Hey, you have a good week. Call me when you get a chance sometime so we can sit down and figure out how to dot the I's and cross the T's. And uh, thank you very much for a job well done. Great, Zeb. You have a good day today. I will, sir. Thank you much. God okay, bless. Bye. Thank you. That was really interesting. He puts his heart and soul into that. Uh, Dr. History, fantastic. Dr. Ken Turner. <clears throat> I'm choking to death. Hold on just a minute. 
don't forget, every Thursday, we have a segment on my program called School Days in Cache County. And it is brought to you by two really, really wonderful businesses. First of all, uh, Child's World, 1308 Overland Avenue in Burley. The number to call, 878-8222. And they've got all kinds of items for you to consider right now. And if a baby is in your family's future, you better come in and look at all the cribs and the uh, dressers. And, of course, check out all the car seats, the high chairs, the strollers, the bouncers, everything. They've got layaway and baby registry is available at a Child's World in Burley. Wonderful folks located at 1308 Overland Avenue in Burley. And then also our thanks to some really wonderful folks that have done a great job for you and your family for many, many years. The Ambulatory Surgery Center. 14 years. Folks in the Magic Valley have come to the Ambulatory Center on Highland Drive in Burley for outstanding personal medical care. And they've saved hundreds of dollars for uh, procedures like cataract and eye surgery, colonoscopies, carpal tunnel, uh, hand surgery, tonsils, you name it. They're there to serve you and serve you well at the Ambulatory Surgery Center, 1344 Highland Avenue in Burley. Excellent job. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take a little break and come back with Randy Hardy on the phone with us in just a few minutes. Don't go away. Now back to Zeb at the Ranch on AM 1230 KBAR. To reach Zeb, call 436-2244 or toll free 1-866-927-4587. And now, here is Zeb Bell. Oh my, every day we get a little bit stronger sitting here on the program. And uh, thanks to Gina for all she does to give us help over at the station. Uh, and with that being said, we're going to go right to the phone line right now because we have with with us, a uh, man that has been elected as the National Potato Council's president for 2014, Oakley, Idaho's Randy Hardy. Good morning, Randy. How are you? Good morning, Zeb. I'm doing great. Well, Randy, uh, tell us a little bit about this honor that's been bestowed upon you as far as being the new president. Uh, a little bit about the job and what the council's doing, and give us a little background. Well, I guess the honor of it is being recognized by peers that I'm capable of the job, and I take that pretty seriously. Idaho represents a great portion of the potato growing industry, and and uh, it's good that we have a voice. The National Potato Council is is basically the lobbying organization of the potato industry, and we uh, we dabble in the government affairs and regulatory affairs. Back in D.C., we have a staff of five very capable people that uh, work on behalf of the potato industry every day. And uh, one of those is, is uh, virtually on the hill every day, visiting with uh, representatives and and uh, listening to what's going on in the back halls. And so we've, we've uh, developed the Potato Council into a pretty influential group back there as far as uh, getting, getting things accomplished. Randy, let me ask you this. Uh, are there other states, naturally, that have potato councils? Uh, do you try to work with them so that you've got more power in numbers? Oh, they're absolutely critical to what the council does, and basically the, the National Potato Council is the uh, organization in D.C., but we turn around and rely on state organizations virtually every day. There's, there's emails going back and forth. The Idaho Potato Commission is very active. Um, Idaho Growers and Shippers, as well as other state organizations, but we rely on them to contact the representatives from those states mm -hmm. and also get the word out to individual growers. Now, when you talk about government and regulations and everything else, uh, Randy, it looks like agriculture always is scrutinized for more government regulations. Uh, how concerned are you looking into your crystal ball in the future, not only for potatoes but agriculture in general? What's it look like? Well, I'm very concerned about it, Evan. That's why it's kind of been my platform a little bit this year, not in running for the office, but in in what I want to see happen. I've been involved in both the council and the board now for almost 20 years, and what I see is is the voice of agriculture is great diminishing, and and you know that. But uh, you know, Secretary Vilsack said it very plainly that that the reason there isn't a farm bill is basically basically because agriculture has become irrelevant um, and and that's that's where the war cry comes in you know we've got to, we've got to pick the things that we need to work on we need to be very vocal and very firm about 
trying to get them accomplished. You know, when you say that word, though, and with Vilsack saying agriculture has become irrelevant, how? How can they sit there and say something so frivolously stupid when they don't realize, evidently, that uh, the American farmer and rancher is basically feeding the world? How can they use the term irrelevant? Well, he used the term irrelevant as it refers to politics, and he, he wasn't doing it in a demeaning way. He was doing it in a way to try to wake us all up. And basically that's what he is saying, is that in the politics of this country, right now farmers and ranchers represent less than 1% of the population. And so how do you, how do you think the other 99% feels about farm policy, especially when it comes to a farm bill? and the fact that over 80 percent of that has to do with SNAP or food stamps. Actual farm programs and what affects rural America is such a small percentage that when it comes to political views and regulatory views, um, they don't really care about agriculture because they can get their food at the grocery store. Do you feel, Randy, and you and I have talked about this before on this program, uh, especially with Michelle Obama's campaign on obesity, which I think was very ill-founded and ill-conceived, uh, I think that our children need to have an exercise program back in the schools first and foremost, and we wouldn't have the problem they claim we have. But do you feel that the government is picking and choosing various crops and produce, etc., that they want to see survive and or go under? Well, I think with Michelle especially, she's targeted She's targeted anything that isn't green, basically, and the potatoes, is, we got a big target on the back, and, you know, we had this conversation when it came to the school lunch issue, and, and we won that one, but they keep throwing them at us, and the latest is the WIC program. You know, there's, there are a lot of people involved in the Women, Infants, and Children feeding program, and basically in 2007, uh, USDA revised the WIC to include all fruits and vegetables except white potatoes. It's the only vegetable or fruit that is not included. And they, they use uh, guidelines from the Institute of Medicine that were formulated back then that said that diet should only include one to three cups of starchy vegetables per week. Um, and so, so far they've kept potatoes out of the WIC program. But what we're doing now is trying to point out the fact that new guidelines released in 2010 have more than doubled that recommended volume of, of starchy vegetables in the diet. And, you know, it, it, it's definitely that the White House um, is trying to, to push back against potatoes and they're using, you know, sadly they're using french fries as the enemy. And french fries, you know, they have their own source of nutrition as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, um, so we're fighting very hard on that one, and, and actually in the Farm Bill write-up and also in the Ag Appropriations write-up is a fix to the WIC program to where we can get white potatoes into the WIC. But, but therein lies That's the right. problem. Therein lies the problem, too, Randy, as uh, president of the uh, uh, National Potato Council and being an outstanding farmer for years here in the Oakley area. Uh, you know as well as anybody does that the respect for American agriculture has been on the wane, and there's been many, many politicians, including Al Gore and others, that have diminished the value of agriculture to our young people as far as getting involved for a job and a life's work. How are we going to counteract that, or has it gone too far? Well, I'm, I'm concerned that it's gone too far, but, uh, you know, to continue to feed off what Secretary Vilsack said a year ago, uh, we have a product to sell. You know, agriculture is a product that we can sell. And there's not nearly as many farmers as there used to be, but there's still a tremendous amount of people involved in agriculture. And there actually is a shortage of good people in agriculture. Somebody's going to grow the food. Somebody's going to farm the land. Somebody's going to re be responsible that it's a quality product and a safe product. And so agriculture is still a good place to be it's a good place to go and that's that's the message that you know myself in my role and and every other farmer has got to continue to to uh, produce mm -hmm. um, as far as our image with the with the public you know I think agriculture and farmers in general stand very high highly in the view of the, of the average consumer but 
again, it comes back to politically. We just do not have the clout that agriculture used to have. When we talk about the clout that you used to have, we've seen a transition in the classroom. And it's not just the classrooms back in the Midwest or the East Coast or down South. It's classrooms all over America, even out here in the West in, in the heart of producing country like Idaho for potatoes. What in the world is going on with this new breed of teacher that seems to be condemning and actually damning American agriculture? I don't understand that, uh, but it, it really is true, and I, I guess they just believe some of the things they read. But uh, you know, it's it's something we need to address, and it's a very hard thing to address, other than just continue to to push the nutrition issue. You know how nutritious potatoes are. Uh, it, it's unbelievable, as nutritious as they are, as cheap as they are, as plentiful as they are, that we have to fight the kind of battles we do, and, and it's the same thing with with uh, you know any food that people enjoy it seems like they're they're the ones they target now as the president uh, on a weekly monthly basis uh, what do they have you doing going around to various uh, meetings and uh, various things with the government to speak i mean give us a little background on what you're expected to do well the next couple of months basically is when all the states have their their grower meetings such as you know idaho's today and tomorrow in Pocatello, and I'll be up there tomorrow speaking in, with, the, with one of the representatives from the council. Um, you know, I'm slated to go to Michigan, probably go to Wisconsin. We have somebody on the executive committee basically at every grower meeting, and that's what we're doing particularly this year is trying to stand up and get them to you know, voice, voice their opinion, stand up and talk about agriculture. Don't be afraid to write an op-ed for the paper. Don't be afraid to get on the radio like this. Don't be afraid to uh, approach a produce manager who is uh, showing potatoes that don't look good or talk to consumers on the street about the value of potatoes. You know, we just got to be more vocal. Mm -hmm. um, the end of February is what we have that we call a DC fly-in where potato industry growers and state managers go to DC February 25th, 6th, and 7th. Uh, we have speakers come in and talk to us, and we're able to give feedback to them. Uh, we actually have Bob Beckel, we have Cal Thomas, we have uh, oh, Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. They're they're coming to speak to us. We have an opportunity to meet with USDA. There's a contingent to go that goes to EPA. We express our concerns. We listen to them. We have a really good relationship with both USDA and EPA. And then we spend a day up on the hill talking to not only our own delegations, but we try to go into congressmen who may need their opinions weighed. And, uh, you know, we try to sit down with them or at least their aides and, and uh, express our concerns. It's, it's been a really valuable experience. And the rest of the year, you know, I, I host a meeting in Sun Valley in June and uh, we'll continue to go where needed, but it's mainly just getting the word out, talking about potatoes and trying to press the issues that are important right now. Let me ask you this, Randy, and of course I've been in advertising for the last 45 years, but now as the president of the Potato Council and with all the different people you work with, uh, and you have to work with various and sundry groups, whether it's the beef people or the onion people or the bean people or like your own niche, the potato people. Is agriculture doing enough or doing the right kind of advertising to really solidify the deal with the American public? It's difficult to advertise a commodity. Deb. That, that's, that's one thing that the potato board has struggled with, is trying to advertise a commodity. Beef, basically, is in the same boat. Um, it, it's hard to get on TV or radio and say, by golly, potatoes are good for you, eat more of them because everybody you talk to loves potatoes, but due to lifestyle changes and everything that's going on with our busy lives, people just sit down and eat potatoes less. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. But basically, you just need to keep it in front of them, and we work with those other groups trying to, to gain attention to nutrition and convenience. Those are two things that we work very hard on in the potato industry. But... You know, lifestyles change, the culture changes, and we have to change with it. 
when you talk about somebody like you mentioned Bob Beckel just a little bit ago, uh, Bob, of course, uh, very, very liberal. But when you visit with someone like him, uh, what's your main goal and aspiration to get him to understand and appreciate agriculture so there's not the animus against it? What do you really are trying to do with these people? What we found, Zeb, is that when we get somebody like a Bob Beckel in the room, and last year we uh, we had Donna Brazil, believe it or not, mm -hmm. and, and she did a really good job. But when they get in a room with a bunch of farmers, and I know you understand this, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and they feel that difference. We just had Ben Stein talk to us down in San Antonio, and he went on and on. He has a home in Sandpoint, and he went on and on about the goodness of agricultural people and the goodness of Idaho and 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 praise us for being who we are and they start to they start to understand that and and they pay more attention to agriculture and and basically when you get those guys one on one their their big sentiment is that we need to get both sides talking to each other more mm -hmm. you know there's absolutely nothing being accomplished in DC now we see it with the farm bill and immigration and tax reform and everything else nothing's being done and and though you may not agree with the other side, sometimes you've got to get together and iron things out like they used to do. Well, that leads me to a question, and I'm not trying to turn this into a political question, but I think you and I both know each other well enough, it has to be asked. We're seeing such gridlock, and we're seeing such uh, absolutely asinine and amateuristic attitudes back there. Is it time, Randy, in your opinion, to just kind of wipe the slate clean and start implementation of term limits and put these people in so that they work for the constituents instead of their own pockets and future? Well, a few years ago, I was a big opponent of term limits. You know, I thought if you got a good guy in there, he needs to be able to stay in there. But I think what we've seen, it's the young guys that come in with energy, and, and they're not necessarily looking to be lifetime politicians. But those are the ones that are anxious to get things done. And I, I very definitely think it's time to, to start over and, and make term limits of you know, one or two terms and rotate people through there that have the energy and the ambition and they don't have the the uh, the secondary things playing games with them. You know, I'll, I'll help you if you'll help me. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I want to wish you a lot of luck. I certainly hope you come back and visit us on this program again. Uh, Randy Hardy, the National Potato Council President for 2014. Thank you for taking your time on a busy morning, and we'll look forward to talking to you again, Randy. Thanks so much. You're sure welcome, Zeb. we got a lot of things we could talk about. All right, sir. God bless you. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice gentleman. I've known him for a long time, and uh, he's a good one. He'll do a great job as president of the National Potato Council, and that's Randy Hardy from Oakley. Just really a nice guy. Time for the weather forecast update. Here's Michael Rogers' weather. Michael Rogers from MichaelRogersWeather.com. We're changing our weather pattern for today. No change tomorrow. It's pretty much the same to the last seven days. So you're going to see a lot of sun. Very little clouds. You know, it would be nice if we get up, say, let's see. You know, what's a good number? 52. Yeah, 52 would be nice, but you're going to get the higher 48 today. So enjoy the weather. It is the only weather you got. There's the best. MichaelRogersWeather.com. Thank you very much. Oh, my. Let's take a look here. Oh, it's time to tell you about our Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers. All seven locations serving you, and service is the key word with the best of winter traction tires, all the tires that are pinned for stud, all the different tread designs, and they've got, of course, all the snow chains, and they've got the snow wheels. They've got the best in batteries, best brake value promise in the industry, shocks and struts, front end alignments. There you go. It's all there for you at your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers. Centers. Stop in and see my friends, Lane and Rupert, Dave on Blue Lakes and Twin, Mike and Buell, Mike and Jerome. Don't forget the Twist family over in Paul, John on Pauline in Twin Falls, and Randy on Overland in Burley, your Magic Valley, Les Schwab Tire Centers. Gina, I'm tired. <laughs> Are you now? Is it catching up with you? It did. Uh, about 20 after 10, I started to feel the old leg going kathump, 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 kathump. And I said, it's it's been a long morning so far. But every day we get a little bit stronger. But uh, let's just quickly, I think what I'm going to do is uh, kind of give you a review as to what we're going to do tomorrow. 
Okay. And then I might have you put on a song, and we're a couple minutes better than we were yesterday. We're gaining on it. There you go. Uh, tomorrow, first hour. Now, we do have a slight change tomorrow morning in the first hour. I just want to alert you that 8.30, we're going to have Representative Fred Woods in our open forum tomorrow from 8.30 to 9, okay? Okay. And then, of course, we've got our old buddy, the Colorado Cowboy himself, Doug Johnson, coming in at 9.06. Mm -hmm. And uh, 9.30, we are not sure if our attorney friend, James Herson from California, is going to make that or not. i got to call his office this afternoon. And uh, then at 10 o'clock, we're going to have our monthly visit with the Idaho Fish and Game, and that will round out the program for tomorrow. Oh, so you get to see Kelvin Hatch tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Just make sure that you keep your leg out of the way and uh, you give him something to play with. He absolutely has all these little kind of cushy toys so he doesn't tie up all the cords. I've never seen anybody so nervous in my life. He takes all the mic cords and ties them in knots. Hey, he's a he's a fidgeter, apparently. You're being kind on the air. Well, I have to be. I know it. Yes. <laughs> but no, and uh, again, kudos to you for all you do. And uh, Gina Jameson, the best over there, and I'll be calling you, or you can call me a little bit later. And it. I'm going to go prop the old leg up right now and put an ice pack on it. And we'll see everybody tomorrow at 8.06. Is that at the ranch? We'll ride the horse for three hours and then uh, take another break. Have have a good one. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow morning.